Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Yeah, I'm, open, I'm, on, I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and I'm, I know it's a black moon. I'm, yeah. like, I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. This week's guest, all round energizer bunny that is Nash favourite and Northern Angling Show spectacular Nick Reedy Maddox, Reedy, as I affectionately know him. But before I bring him out, I've got Max Hendry in for some Nash news. Max, how are you, mate? Very good, thanks, mate. You how about yourself? I'm, I'm warm in here. Yeah, it is warm, isn't it, actually? Should I we... think there's no airflow, really, Hassan. I think that's probably a good thing, because what has just happened before <laughs> we've come into this podcast studio, Max, I think sort of breaks every health and safety law that we've signed contracts for, mate. Yeah, I think I would have rather lived in a vacuum, to be honest, after seeing that, but I so it is. <laughs> All I'm going to say is Dan Yeomans, a brown trout in the metaphorical sense, a toilet and blocking, and two guys from product development doing their very best. <laughs> Dan, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Absolutely incredible scenes. Sorry if you're eating. Um, enough of that. On to firmer things, mate. How have you been? How's life? What's going on? I've been good, I must admit. Um, lots of things going on in my life, both personal and work. So that's always good. So uh, yeah, I've got a five-month-old son now. So Aww. yeah, been enjoying dad, dadhood, I suppose. And uh, yeah, getting on with that. And uh, yeah, really amazing to be a uh, part of, to be honest. Sleeping? Is he sleeping? Um. Did the no- normal newborn thing, yeah. sort of every two hours, but now he's getting, I think it's about nine o'clock till seven in the morning. Are so you I taking could, the... Hmm, so I'm doing all right at the moment. He's He's got he's got maximum chill, but the, the hard bit is getting him to sleep. I need like an hour to get him worked down with, nice. with Charlotte so that we can get him to sleep. But once it happens, yeah, I've, we've knocked him out. Oh, yeah, I'll take that. I've got two nipple little girls. What are they, four and nearly three now? And uh, you do not like the old sleep, boy. No, I get up earlier than him. Get <laughs> sorted and make a cup of tea and do a bit of work. And then it's like, all right, cool. You're awake now. I'll have a little play before I go to work or whatever. So it's good. Oh, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, he's kind of got on my timetable, to be honest. He's adapted. I love <laughs> so that. It's good. He's become Max Hendry eyes. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Um, In terms of. Kids, as we're talking about them. I'm going to talk a little bit about, I think, family fishing. Now, Al, obviously, in terms of what he does with the girls, those family fishing videos are always pretty mega, mate. They go down really well. For you, looking forwards, Mm. family fishing, you're going to give it a go? What age? What are your thoughts? I always said I wasn't going to push... I wasn't going to be like a helicopter dad and push my kid into whatever he wants to do or whatever I want him to do. So you get a helicopter mum, don't you? That's like all over the kid. Like, yeah, you must go and do this. And I don't want like to live vicariously through my child <laughs> as such. So what I'd rather do is go, you know what, if you want to come with me, I will show you and you can do a bit of tiddler bashing and do the basics, you know, the stuff that we all learned when we were younger and then go from there. And if he really enjoys it, then I'll embrace it. I'm not going to be the guy that goes, right, you're coming fishing with me because that's what we do. I'm going to go, oh, if you want to go and play football, you can play football. If you want to go rock climbing, you can go rock climbing. You can do whatever you want. I will help you do that, but I'm not going to push fishing on him until he goes, you know what, I want to do this because I've seen it loads of times. People Mm. do it when they're young, then they sell all their fishing tackle or when they get much older, normally they discover women, don't they, around sort of 18 to 21 and partying and stuff like that. I know I did, and that was <laughs> that was it. I didn't go fishing for quite a long while, so he's going to do that. I know he will, but 
ultimately, if he really enjoyed fishing as a hobby properly, he will do that. He will always come back to it, but he will give up quick if he feels like it was just a way to spend time with his dad, if you know what I mean. So that's the way I see it. But in so. the meantime, you've got a mobile with various pictures of the Burfield coming on, just going round and round in front of him. So he's taking it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you will. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've already been telling him, like, I've done a, a carp history uh, recording and I just put it next to his head for the night and that's how that's I get him good. to sleep. That's good. I reckon if a few kids listen to this podcast, it'll send them to sleep, mate. Yeah. <laughs> if not that's, the adults. That's because that's, that's you've got me on. That's <laughs> no. No other reason. No, not at all, Max. <laughs> um, in terms of, so there, you're talking about him being a little bit older before. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we have we went away to New Forest and it was a fishing lake. Obviously, he wasn't of the mental capacity to really understand where the hell he was, but um, we had a nice time outdoors. I want him to be outdoorsy. Yeah. That's yeah. more important to me than him being a fisherman because I wouldn't mind going, well, if you like being in the outdoors, let's go and walk up a mountain or let's do this, you know, let's do that sort of thing that's just being in the outdoors and appreciating it really. Yeah. Because that's what fishing gave me. It's an appreciation for the outdoors and that to me is more fulfilling probably than the angling is in some part as well. So I'd like to think that he will do the same, you know. Yeah, mate, I, I'm with you. I, as I said, my two are a little bit older. They're definitely outdoorsy. They've got no choice with me and Laura. We are <laughs> pretty outdoorsy and always doing some form of sport or exercise or something. So that's good. I've taken them fishing. Mm-hmm. They've got, they're pretty keen for like, oh, we only go for like 10, 15 minutes locally and they're happy. Mm. I'm keeping it very minimal. We did go to the Cotswolds and stayed at, um, what, what is the name? Uh, Welford Pools. Mm-hmm. Um, and we fished out the back garden on a big old holiday lake with everyone, which was really nice. And it wasn't, uh, the rods were out, but it weren't like constant. I weren't making them fish, but they were interested. So I'm happy the stage I'm at in terms of I'm not killing it. I've not drummed it into them, but inherently there's some interest with both of them. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but I'm not going to force them. Like you say, I don't want to be a helicopter dad. Got to dad. Yeah. I love that, Max. <laughs> That's a classic Max Hendry saying already, <laughs> mate. I'm going to take that to the bank. Um, and I think uh, anybody else out there, for you, like in terms of outdoor and getting involved in fishing, do you reckon like the classic pond dipping, make it fun and then progress from there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mate, I'm yeah. all about that. I'm, like, don't get me wrong. What Alan does with the girls, incredible. And it's such a great way of, um, like as an ambassador, really, yeah. to show what can be done. And how much interest and what they thrive on the kids when they're there. Because it is a really, really, really cool. But like I say, I will probably see how, how it develops with my son, you know, and see yeah. how he gets on. So I'm, I'm not going to push it, but I tell you what, I'm not going to complain if he wants to jump in a boat with me in Belgium and go on the river for like four nights. And <laughs> really, on the board. Yeah, like it might be well game, you know, like yeah. let's go for an adventure, proper an adventure, you know, like that. And see whether he sort of really takes that on. You might be really interested, you know. It's a dream, mate. Most important thing, if you're out there and fishing, you're enjoying it. And if you can get family involved, all the better. I think that equals more fishing time, Max, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what I said to Charlotte, (laughs) my other half. I was like, this could really work for me, you know. Like we could be away on some lovely lake in in abroad or even in England for the weekend. You can do your shopping and like whatever you enjoy to just do your own time. And I'll happily have the kid. (laughs) Like he's all good. (laughs) Perfect. Well, we'll see how it pans out, but it's all good. Um, I am now going to go and get the absolute enigma that is Reedy. Um, depending on whatever he's doing out there, he's probably hopping about the office. Um, thank you for coming in, mate. Thank you for this section and I'll see you soon. Yeah. Take care, mate. Welcome to the podcast, Nick Reedy Maddox. I'm just going to call you Reedy. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you, mate. Yourself? Yeah, good. That felt really wrong, calling you Nick Reedy Maddox. Yeah, it's not... Uh, well, it's either one or the other. You either know me as Nick or Reedy, but I'd say most people at Nash probably know me as Reedy, so... What's the significance of... Re- I've never asked you this. What's the significance of Reedy? Where has Reedy come from? Uh, so it come from when I was at college doing fishery management. Uh, first day at the college, um, we were walking around the grounds and there's a, uh, a lecturer of some description. He's walking around and he's telling us this is how you can tell the uh, the difference between a harsh reed and a common reed. You split the reed down the centre and one has a discontinuous pith. And I'll never forget that because on the day I thought, being a cocky little bell end, I thought, oh, 
you know, everyone, this is how you can tell the difference between the reeds. And one of the lads turned around and it was all right, reed boy, shortened to reedy, and that was it. It stuck since I was like 15 years old. So I love Yeah, that, that's mate. it. That's where it come from. Reedy. I now know the meaning of reedy. I only know you as reedy. I can't call you Nick. It just seems wrong. Yeah. Matt. Yeah. Good boy. How have you been recently? Very good? Yeah, good, good. Busy now that I'm back here and I've had you hounding me. So, you know, I thought I'd just get it checked off, get it done. <laughs> and then he'll stop pecking my head. Tick this in the box, boy. Get him out of the way. Um, We're going to talk about you coming back, but you are officially, to gloss over it, back in the Nash table working for Nash Tackle. Correct. In yes. a very... um prestigious capacity i'm gonna say it's an important role you've got mate aren't you yeah that's it i've um jumped in at the deep end kind of really so go on the boy yeah but obviously you have been here before which we're going to talk about and we're going to do a little whistle stop tour of sort of your angling your previous experience at nash and then full circle to what will be uh no doubt a very um successful future with the company i can see it mate you've been a uh, pretty mega even though you've only started a few was it a few weeks since you've been back yeah second week now really so or the second full-time week and then a few days here and there beforehand but yeah good man what were you doing in, be- in between that much fishing recently or not and um, since i've come back here absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> which is generally the way it goes but um yeah up until i was back here yeah doing a fair bit here and there sort of joined a new syndicate and stuff so yeah that's been all right nice you were nervous before this mate weren't you yeah, I don't like things like this. You see, oh, you're trying to get out of it. You still, if I could have replayed the clips, he's trying to duck it. Tried to duck it last week. I've pinned you down this week. I think there was a nervous trip to the toilet and some caffeine needed to get him in here. So I've locked the door. You can't get out for the foreseeable, mate. I'm thank feeling you a bit under the weather, it. actually, as it goes, mate. I think I... Um... <laughs> Play that COVID card next, mate. I can see it coming. <clears throat> um, so we're going to start sort of with your... I don't know, earlier years angling experience? Because I know probably with regards to your angling stuff you've done, maybe when you left Nash, but I want to look back at the Bedfordshire boy back in the day and talk me through your early years, sort of fundamental founding years of carp fishing, mate. So, yeah, as you say, um, I grew up in Bedford. I was, um, I've been into fishing since I was a kid. I was very fortunate that like most people not like most people but like a lot of people my old man was into into fishing so went a lot with him as a kid um both me and my sister we'd go along he'd sort of fish for carp and we'd fish for whatever come along sort of sat float fishing um and then yeah that progressed until i eventually caught you, your usual, your roach, your perch, and then bream, and then caught a few tench and then it was like right now i fancy catching some of these carp and stuff like that so yeah, um, we'd go along with dad, like I say, um, and eventually I'd sort of badgered him enough to say, oh, I want to put out a carp rod at night now. I don't want to just fish for small bits in the day and stuff like that. So, yeah, eventually got round to that and, um, yeah, started doing a bit of carp fishing at Country Park in Bedfordshire. So, yeah, started fishing there. Um and that sort of slowly progressed um, into, well, as I say, going with my dad. And then eventually I'd be sort of pecking mum and dad's head. Can I go and do nights on my own or like with friends and stuff? Um, and it took a good few years before they'd sort of let me go on my own. It weren't the uh, most secure of places, should we say. There was the odd goings on and you'd get kids going down there you'd get sort of the hooligans if you like of bedford that go down there on the piss up or whatever bedford. else so, yeah really well, oh yeah oh yeah bad yeah well it, it probably not so bad not like it was in the bronx but it was like it was like they do you know what i mean it not the kind of people that your parents would want you hanging out with when you was 12 13 14 yeah. and stuff like that so um yeah it took a little while of doing plenty of nights with my dad and then eventually probably 13, 14, maybe 15 years old, event now, nah, probably a bit younger actually. Probably, t- yeah, 12, 13 years old. I'd eventually been allowed, right? If there's a group of you go in, you can all go down, do a night, this, that, and the other. So, yeah, did plenty of years on there. It wasn't the, um, it weren't the easiest of places to fish. It was like 60 odd acres and had, I don't know, a couple of hundred carp in it, which doesn't, it sounds, oh. it sounds a lot now, but when you was a kid and nah, you, not when you learn it, that is tough. When you didn't really know what you were doing, it was, um, I basically learned to blank. I, I learned that blanks are part of the picture. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, yeah, it didn't come too, too quickly, should we say, but, um, but yeah, enjoyed loads of good times down there. Just literally spent summer holidays, but we were fortunate as well that 
it had a bit of everything. You had the river ooze there. You had little tiny little streams and cuts and bits and bobs. So I did a lot of roach fishing, perch fishing, chub fishing on the rivers, um, caught a few barbell and stuff like that as well. So I'd just spend summer holidays down there constantly. Mm. That was kind of where it all stemmed from. Um, yeah, for a number of years, really. There was, uh, yeah a lot of good friends that I used to go with. Um, and that was what sort of kept us occupied. I didn't really get into any other sports. I didn't get into football. Or, well, I tried to get into football, but they told me I was shit. So I was just like, <laughs> right, okay, well, Done. yeah, right, cross that one off. Uh, <laughs> we'll stick to fishing, which I'm also not very good at either. But oh, it's, know, um, yeah, no, so that was kind of where we, uh, yeah, where I grew up and what I did. It was all, uh, all around that one sort of country park. Um, and yeah, that kept me entertained for, well, up until I was pretty much till I went to college when I was 16, um, did my fishery management course. And then after that, I ended up moving down to Essex and that was when I joined Nash. So that was kind of the end of my Bedford fishing, if you like. I didn't do quite so much there after I'd moved down here. Yeah, so. of course. But Bedford, when you're talking about this country park, in terms of significant captures, I think a landmark moment has got to be everyone's first 20 on it. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, good story to go with that one. So there was, there's a part on the on the on the sort of uh, on the lake where, let's say, you're not strictly supposed to fish, um, <laughs> but and of course, all the carp live there because yeah, yeah they all live in the out bounds. So um, on, uh, I think it might, yeah, it was. It was on a school night actually, so it would have been midweek, and um, I'd pestered dad like, come on, come on, let's go and do another night. We'll go and do another night, and he'd be like, yeah, all right, sweet, we'll go. We've gone into, we've fished the outer bounds from uh, like, via various means. I would sort of got the rods into the spots and. Uh, what are you saying there? Various means. So you had to basically creep into some areas. Yeah, is it properly policed then? Like a ranger? No, there, not. Well, no. there is, there is, there was back then. There was park rangers. Now they, yeah, the, it's kind of a bit of a free for all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so we'd got into the outer bounds with fishing caught plenty as always it was like a prolific spot you could catch a good light you could catch a fair few in there and um i think dad had had one and i'd had i think it was 20 uh, from memory it was like 22 pound four ounce or something could common hey, that's a beast isn't it at the time i was only young it was like oh my god it's a monster i'm buzzing with it it's my first ever 20 so like dad's like right well we won't do pitches in the night we'll get some decent pitches in the morning no probs so dad goes down puts it in the sack um zips it all up yeah brilliant ties it off to the bank stick yeah checks the knots yeah it's all good pack everything up in the morning everything's in the van last thing to do is pick the sack up get the photos dad goes to get the sack picks it up there's no cart no he's literally left a gap like that at the end where it must have got jammed on the like where the sack gets jammed in this in the zip or something like that Left the tiniest gap, gone back to it in the morning. The carp's got off. It's gone. Bust through that. It's gone. It's gone out the sack. Dad looked at me like, um, oh, no. "Yeah, sorry, mate. There's there's no fish." I seem to remember being in the van on the way to school, just like, "Yeah." No words. Did you cry? I'd have cried. I don't think there was tears, but oh, I, I definitely, definitely wasn't very talkative that morning. No. That feeling as a, d- I'm I'm thinking of it from a parent's point of view as well as a dad. There's probably no better moment than like fish pictures with your kids and then your kid's very <laughs> first significant fish, you flopped it basically. Yeah. What do you do in that? Kind of <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I, th- I think it might be something like, oh, no, I don't think it was that big anyway. Just don't worry about that one. We'll brush it under the table. It'd be fun. So, but yeah, that one was gone and, um, but you know. On so. there, on that country park, you said they're obviously your first 20, but in terms of learning curve for your carp fishing, what sort of point did you get to around baits, rigs, feeling for drops, things like that? Were you, was that was it that technical, or were you sort of just casting at showing fish, or just all about like locating them? It How was just casting into the abyss, mate. Yeah. It was just like no. To be fair, it I, it did help me develop. Like I'd learn, I'd learn about marker floats, and uh, bearing, uh, like whilst I was progressing here, my old man was still fishing it with his friends and stuff. So I'd go down and I'd, I was learning a lot. I was taking in a lot from these other guys. Um, 
and yeah, I basically put it upon myself like, right, I'm going to use a marker float. So that would obviously help with your accuracy and just getting bang on the money. And then eventually I learned, well, more and more how to use a marker, right? There's a, a divot, there's a, yeah. a hump, there's a bar, whatever. So learned quite a lot about that. Um, rigs and baits, not really. I didn't really delve into it too much. I still don't now. I still really? don't. Really? Yeah, they're silt pigs, man. Just like. I love it, yeah. Silk they are. They said just, just put a bait on and just have a sharp hook and nine times out of ten you're going to get a bite. Don't get me wrong. There'll be people watching this going, you're a fucking idiot. Like, <laughs> you're an idiot. What are you all about? But that's my, I can't, I, I think the reason being I can't get tied up into it because if I do, I'll overthink it a lot and I'll become all paranoid. So I'm just like, right, keep it simple. Just hook, line, bait, right spot. So for me, it was more, I learned more about finding spots and making sure that you're actually presented. So you're not in the weed, you're not in the shitty sill or whatever. Mm. Make sure you're presented. And that was kind of what I learned there. So that was the, kind of where I'd got up to. I felt pretty, pretty, um, what's the word? Pretty efficient in, I can like, I can hit the marker. I know what I'm feeling for. So I can kind of, yeah, work, I know where I need to fish as such. That was where I'd got up to there. What was... Don't take this wrong way, but when I think of, of you, I think one of the first things I think of is just like an absolute whirlwind of like energy. And if I'd have, if I if I met you in like I wouldn't say normal life, but outside of the realms of Nash, I'd be like, "There's no way he goes cart fishing." Like long periods of like inactivity. <laughs> um, all right, you might move or be quite mobile or whatever, but it doesn't seem fast paced enough even at the fastest extreme, to sort of keep you engaged. What? Why Why carp fishing? Because I can't see, though, that your personality marrying up with it on paper. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. That is a strange one because you're right. Like, I am very energetic and... But I don't know. Yeah, I think it's... As cliche as it sounds, and for a lot of people, I actually do enjoy just switching off, being there. Do you know what I mean? Not actually, like... It's an escape is one thing. I like catching big fish. I like, definitely for me, the favourite bit is the bite. Mm. It's always the bite. Like when it goes in the net, yeah, sweet. Yep, yeah, photo's great. But it's when it goes from naught to a thousand like that and that bite, got, when it happens, I like that adrenaline. So that's probably the bit that keeps me sort of yeah into it, I guess. Yeah. yeah so that's the main thing. What was school like for you? Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, not bad. Got bullied a bit. Did you? Yeah, because I was still the same as I am now, scrawny little like weasel kid. Nothing wrong with that. Man. <laughs> yeah, but no, yeah, it was all right. It weren't too bad. I weren't the in the popular group, but I weren't in the like the nerds group either. I was like the middle of the road kind of guy. Okay. So and you had mates. You said you had a few mates there that you went fishing with. Yeah, they all school related or not? They were all school related. Yeah, there's um. Uh, I don't think any of them actually still fish now. There was, yeah, none of them do, to be <laughs> fair. Thinking back now, there's like, I still speak to a couple of them, not loads of them, but yeah, I still fit, speak to a few, but they don't fish anymore. It was, yeah, it was me that sort of, yeah, yeah. carried it on as such, really. So, And then from there, you said you went the infamous fishery management college. Oh, yes. With a certain lecturer. <laughs> um, talk to me about your time there, mate. Oh, what you can legally. Well, yeah, I've got to be careful what I say, but no, yeah, as you say, I um, so yeah, I was uh, at this age, like fifteen, sixteen, I guess, and uh, I was actually all signed up to go and do a course as an electrician. That's like what I'd sort of like. My mum and dad had split up, and uh, my stepdad had come into sort of mum's life. He was an electrician, and I was like, "Well, yeah, I don't really know what I'm going to do when I finish school. Like, mm. I haven't got a clue." And I thought, "Well, I could go and work with him, and you know, it's a good trade and it's a skill to have, and people are always going to need electricians." So I was like, "Yeah, sweet, I'll sign myself up." And then uh, it was actually my stepdad that sort of come out of the blue, and he said, uh, "You you love your fishing, like you're really into it," and. Uh, his dad, many or either his dad or his granddad, many years ago, used to be a groundskeeper at this college at Shuttleworth College. Um, and he said, "Oh yeah, I know of this college out at Old Warden, uh, and I believe they do a fishery management course. Why don't we go and have a like look? Just go and check it out." So I went down for the open day with him, and uh, yeah, sat down, sort of got a gist of what the course was about. And I was thinking, "Yeah, this sounds sweet. Like it's all about fishing. This is perfect. Mm -hmm. Like sounds sounds great." 
Um, so yeah, went to the college and, um, yeah, it was a mental two years of my life. It was absolutely mental. Like I probably didn't study as hard as I should have done. I partied a lot. Um, but yeah, it was good, man. It was like Alan was there. Um, Tommy Foreman was there. A lot of the other lads that have come through and some of them have since left like ditch and stuff like that. Yeah. They were all people, Matt as well, nipples. Um, yeah, they were all sort of at the college. So we'd all met there and then one by one, we'd sort of slowly come down and started working for Nash. It was when we were at the college, there was, um, it was like most of us were carp anglers, like the lads that yeah. were on the course. It was, and and, and lecturer, the other lecturer, not Alan, Chris, um, he hated carp anglers. Did he? Hated carp anglers. On my first day before it was like, before it even started, it was just the open day. He was like, so what do you want then? I was like, well, I love carp fishing. He was like, oh, I bet you can cast a lead 100 yards, can't you? But you can't do X, Y, Z, this, that, and the other. I was like, jeez. Yeah, he didn't like carp angling at all, but... um can't remember where I was going with that, but uh, yeah, we ended up going to, yeah, the, most of the lads on the course were carp anglers, so we'd all sort of got on, we had our sort of things going on, and uh, yeah, we all sort of were on the same page. Um, oh, I can't remember where I was going with this. It's got to be something about Al, surely. Yeah, so it was basically, yeah, Alan, all of us had sort of gone down, oh, that was it, the, 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 the golden carrot, if you like, was that the college and sort of the course itself had a good relationship with Nash. So if mm. you work really hard and if you do really well, you might get a job at Nash. And that was the thing that everyone was like, I want to work for Nash. I want to work for Nash. <laughs> apart, <laughs> I can probably mention it now, apart from Alan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He said that. <laughs> Did he mention it? Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. So he has brought it up. But um, yeah, everybody wanted to work for Nash. And it was, um, yeah, just so happened that Tommy was out at Cavagnac um, he was already out there working. And then when it comes to do my work experience, um, I basically hounded Tom and was like, tell Chippy Dave that the person they need for work experience is me. Like, <laughs> make sure it happens. And he did. So I got really lucky, went out, did my eight weeks out there. Um, eight it, weeks work experience on Cavagnac? Yeah, man. With Tommy as well? With Tommy. Yeah, Tommy was already working there. Oh, that must have been lawless. Oh, it was excellent. It was you so didn't good. Do anything, did you? Oh, no, we did. I did, did loads you? of cool stuff. Yeah. What? Talk to me about what you actually did building, constructively. Building swims, uh, oh. catching the koi pew. I was there for when Tommy either had to fight the koi pew or jump off the side of the boat. I was there. You were there in the flesh. Yeah, seen it. What a moment in general cart fishing history. Forget yeah. Mary, forget Black Mirror. No. Tommy Foreman in the koi pew. <laughs> Tommy clubbed the koi pew in the middle of the lake. It was great unbelievable yeah that was good um but yeah it was just general stuff it was like right go and deliver breakfast or meals to the anglers and stuff like that that was yeah i was i didn't mind it until i managed to wipe out six rods with a petrol boat for two customers that weren't my best day how did that go down? Yeah, not very well. They'd just spent like a couple of hours putting six rods out between them and they were like, oh yeah, we're buzzing really happy. And they were like, right, take dinner down. So I've taken dinner down. And then as I've come into the swim and sort of turned the boat a bit, I just caught a bit in the wind. Oh. And then as I'd sort of got caught in the wind, I felt like, well, three of his rods started melting and it was obviously going around the prop so then i panicked and went forward oh and then got the other three as well so i took out all six lines in one foul swoop which was um if you're gonna do it do it properly don't do things by ass, mate do it properly do you know what i mean here's your dinner yeah yeah, here's (laughs) dinner and do you want me to put them rods back out for you and uh yeah that, that weren't the best day it happened. But yeah, no, it was good. I enjoyed Cavagnac. Um Did you meet Kev at Cavagnac or had you met him? No, no, I didn't meet Kev at Cavagnac. I didn't meet Kev until um it was after Cavagnac and we had we'd I'd come back from Cavagnac and I think I still hadn't had any more contact from Nash actually. And then Alan had uh been invited down with another couple of lads to come and do a work party on Church and the Cops. Yes. And I think Alan, yeah, Alan had a group of students, two or three students from the year below me at the college. Um, and one of them had dropped out and he rung me last minute. Do you want to come down? Da, 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 da. I was like, yeah, sweet. I'll come. That'll be like, that'll be a good crack. So I come down, done the work experience. And then that was the first time I met Kev. Mad. Yeah. So it's that- weird, like this, you, what you're describing, this period of time sort of spans over probably 
yeah, maybe two of the previous podcasts I did with Alan. So like Alan's told his story from the beginning, obviously the other side of it, but also a subsequent podcast that might not be out yet, but will be out soon about Kevin Fisheries. It's just, it's mad that you were like there and it's all sort of over time come full circle. In terms of Kevin, yeah, I'm going to go back to it. Fishing wise, you were out there working with Tommy, but I'm guessing you had a bit of time to fish. Yeah, we'd get like the odd evening and if like, if it wasn't busy, that was the key thing. <clears throat> Sorry. If it wasn't busy, um, then I'd ask David, who was the late manager at the time, he owns it now, um, you know, can I stick a couple of rods out? And he was sort of, yeah, of course you can crack on. So I'd do a few nights here and there. Um, I caught a few, not loads, nothing massive. Um, although me and Tommy do think I lost a big common one day. Really? There, there was a particular swim where the big common come from and I'd sort of hooked something just as we were about to pack up and go back over to do the breakfast and stuff. And... Um, yeah, I'd hook this fish and it just gave me a big fish fight, like plodding slow, couldn't see the leader. It was out in front of me, couldn't see the leader, which was like four foot long, something like that. So it was down deep, but it was just big vortexes and tail patterns. And it was then then just a little hook pull. And I was like, oh dear. Oh no. But, but you yeah. had, but you did have a few, you caught a few. Yeah, caught a few. Yeah, nothing massive as as I say, but um, yeah, enjoyed it. It was good. Was that your first little taste of sort of continental carping or had you been... Mm. No, I think I had been, funnily enough, with one of the school friends that I mentioned before. Yeah, with him and his dad and his granddad, we'd been to like a proper commercial stacked full of them. So I'd caught a few up to mm, upper 30s, I think. Um, Caught a couple of catfish while we were on that trip. And then, yeah, so that was first time of going over and doing a bit of fishing in France. Mm. Um, <clears throat> again, while I was a kid, sort of, I'd been over with dad, not really on a fishing holiday. It was more with my sister as well. And it was a bit of a sightseeing, but we'll stay at some nice campsites that had some nice lakes. Um, as always, or as it sort of become quite apparent, loads of them campsites are just hidden gems. Yeah. They've all got lakes and nobody really pays attention, but actually they're stacked full of lumps, but they just get ignored because it's not your typical sort of French or over on the continent style of fishing. So yeah, dad did a little bit then in them days and sort of caught a few, but I didn't really fish then. I was too young. So yeah. it was, I was just more there sort of uh, spectating, should we say? <laughs> but yeah, so really going out and then at Cavignac learning to use a bow and that, that was definitely my first time of yeah boat fishing and having to find spots with a rod, lead in rod, bumping a lead around, stuff like that. So yeah, that was the first real taste of that. And I liked it. I liked yeah. it a lot. Yeah? Yeah. I bet. Yeah, I can see it. Well, subsequently, we talk about a couple of real significant sort of continental chapters later. But all throughout this time, when you're sort of at Shuttleworth, you're learning your craft, you've obviously got Al as a lecturer. Now, I know that, and Al said it himself, in terms of his pupil sort of teacher relationship status, if you like, you guys pretty much got stuck in and partied all together. Like Al was not shy about saying that. Um, (laughs) Talk to me about your experiences with Al and how sort of he managed to actually teach you something in amongst all the, uh, the partying and general sort of, I don't know, mate stuff that was going on. The mate stuff. So, I mean, it's like with Al, as many of you, if any of you have met him, you'll realize that he's like, he's infectious and you can, he, he makes people become absorbed into what he's saying and doing and whatever else. But then from a, a student and lecturer perspective, he, um, he was the only lecturer at the college that got it. He was the only person that was relevant to the students. Everyone else was like 50, 60 years old, they don't they don't know what kids are into they don't know what kids are up to they don't know that we just want to get pissed up all the time Mm. like (laughs) do you know what i mean they don't they don't get it whereas alan did get it yeah he knew he'd been there he'd done it and he was like look i know you want to do it but don't take the piss out of me like you've got to yes go and do it get pissed up crack on but be here in the morning yeah and and it was like Fair enough. Like you turn up hang up hung over and he'd know you were hung over, but it was like it weren't a problem. It was like just don't take the piss. Turn up and do your work. And if you do your work, have a work hard, play hard. Exactly that. Exactly that. So yeah, it wasn't an issue. Like and that was probably why I'd 
I dare say every student at the college would have said, yeah, he's the best lecturer because yeah. he was relevant and he got it. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't an old, like just an old battle axe that just wanted to do your editing. Yeah. It was, um, yeah, he was, he was sound. So that side of it was, um, yeah, that was how he sort of managed that. And then in terms of how we sort of got on, it was just through drum and bass. It was, <laughs> It was, it was, and I'll tell you what, it's because Alan's a technophobe, as you probably know. So, yeah, he hates tech. Oh, he can't do it. He, but what he could do was DJ. So mm. he could DJ, he knew how to mix on turntables. What he didn't know how to do was record. And I knew how to record and had a laptop. So instantly Alan's like little light bulb comes on and he's like, him. He'll I'm, do. Yeah, him. I'm going to like basically use him. So you come and da 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 So I ended up recording all of his sets. And then eventually I was like, teach me how to do that. And then and he eventually taught me to DJ, et cetera. So that was kind of how we become more rather than student and lecturer. Yeah, it was more we become mates. So that was kind of how that sort of stepping stone was through that really. That party scene for you though, always there in your like younger years or was it you literally got to Shuttleworth and corrupted? Uh, <laughs> nah, probably always there. And, Mm, yeah, no, I mean, I was young when I went to Shuttleworth. It was like 15, 16, but, yeah. but I don't know, even before that, yeah, that I was down the park with your white lightning and your cider and I'd sort of done all of that as well. And then college was just like an even better place to go and do all that with loads of other people that wanted yeah. to do it as well. But music's always been there, yeah? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's yeah, that's for all of you guys. It's massive, isn't it? Yeah, 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 100%. Yeah, it's probably... I dare say I like music more than fishing. No, he's done it. Yeah, I dare say it. Really? Yeah, it's the thing that's like fishing. I don't mind if I don't go fishing for a week or two. Like, But if I don't listen to music every day, I'd be just a miserable little twat. But all music or just drum and bass? Nah, all music, all music. Yeah, I like everything from reggae, disco, Motown, drum and bass, house music, all of it. Oh, there's hope for you. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's good. What What do you like? What do you I like? You're a country like, or western not, kind of guy. No, no, no. Well, I, I, I listen to country western, mate, but I'm not a, uh, yeah, I'm not a drum and bass head, mate. It's like, um, like really long songs that last forever that have continual beats just make me want to just curl up in a little fetal ball on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but no, like each to their own, mate. It's, um, yeah, it's uh, interesting when you're like, Noted, don't invite you to parties. <laughs> yeah. well, it was interesting when you walk down the church and there's some decks <laughs> in a nice scenic, big sort of carp environment. There's just someone just playing drum and bass. Of but, course. Yeah, it's Nash. Um, in terms of like that relationship with Al, your fishing, and then subsequently your journey to Nash, you actually were at Nash or got to Nash in in a, in a sense before Al did. Yeah. So you talked about Cavagnac, you talked about coming back and not having much contact and then how did that sort of end off at college and then you make it to Nash? So it went from, like I said, we come down on that work experience or that work sort of party where I met Kev, yeah. uh, me, Al and a couple of other lads and then it was only like, yeah, not long after that, a week after that, that Chippy Dave who um, is a warehouse manager he contacted, I don't know whether it was contacted me direct or went through Alan and the college or what, but it was, he contacted me and another lad, Greg, um, who was also down here on the work party, contacted us both and said, look, um, are you interested? We've got some like summer work for you. Do you want to come and work in the warehouses? Me and Greg, we've just come out of college, no idea what we wanted to do. And it was like, yeah, 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 that'll do. And it was just somehow... You know, I was saying that uh, the Golden Carrot was like everyone wanted to work at Nash. There were people that were far more academically skilled and worked a lot harder than me. <laughs> there was, there were some, and um, yeah, I don't know how. Somehow, I managed to fluke it. I just fluked it. it was Take like that. Yeah, sweet. You must have done a good job at Cavagnac. Well, that this is it. Yeah, I think it's like I don't know. Yeah, the truth is. Yeah, it's not like what you know, it's who you are and like, and who you know as well. Do you know what I mean? If I wasn't good friends with Alan and he hadn't said come down on the work party, then it might not have ever happened. But yeah, I did, I did all right at the, at Cavignac and then obviously did a good job when we come down on the work party here and that was enough of what they wanted to see. Yep, yeah, sweet. They're grafters. They'll do the work. 
Job done. And they're keen, so yeah, do you want to have it? So what, what was meeting Kev like? Yeah, all right. First time was like proper starstruck, like oh my god. Were you? Yeah, yeah, big cool. fanboy job, yeah. Well, uh, being like 15, 16, 17 years old, and it was like, oh my god, it's Kevin Nash, it's actually him. And then um yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a bit like starstruck. And then as you go on, and it's the same with anything, like uh you meet famous people and you realise they're just people. They're mm. just people, the same as everyone else. And that's exactly how it's progressed over the years that Nashy's just Nashy, isn't it? He's um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um but yeah, that was that was interesting. Um it was a good weekend. Yeah, we had a good uh, a good crack down here. We partied as well, but we worked hard and we got the job done. So yeah, it was good. And so warehouse, was it? Where in the warehouse you were working to start with it now? Yeah, that's correct. What's warehouse life like? Ah, uh, yeah, not the best. <laughs> not the best. Not the best? No, it was all right. It was good. It was um it was hard work, it was busy. That was like back in the day when everything was run from here. It was mm. run from the farm, so a different beast to what is here now do you know what i mean so um yeah that was just yeah general stuff picking orders packing orders sending them out and it was just a bit for me it was all right but it was it was good at first but it was a bit monotonous it was like guess what i'm doing today picking more orders (laughs) and guess what you're doing tomorrow picking more orders it's like oh yeah it was all right for a while um and then it just become a bit tiresome so um but with that, I was still living at the time. I was still based, if you like, at mum and dad's at home, or yeah, I was based at my mum's house. So I was down here quite a lot. So mm. Nashy was like, "Yeah, you can stay in the lodge. Like it's free rent, obviously." And I'm thinking, "Sweet, well, free. I get to live between the church lake and the cops. Great, that'll do." So I was down here like five nights a week, uh, working in the warehouse. But of an evening at the time, I didn't really drive. I didn't drive. I didn't have a driving license. So. Um, it was like, well, what am I going to do with an evening? Like, yeah. what am I going to do? What I should have done is poach the church and the cops, but I didn't. Did, so, you, not, did you not even ask nah, Kev to fish him? Nah, never, There'd never. There'd been no one on them as well. No, I know. I'm back there. No one. No one. And if then, that was you now going back. Oh uh, if I was, God. If I knew what I knew now, I would have caught every single one of them. Kev, <laughs> all your carp have got, like, little hook marks in them? Yeah. You said they've not been out for ages? <laughs> Mate, I so should have, but I didn't because I thought, no, no, if he catches me or if I find out, yeah. I'll lose my job and I didn't want to like break his trust and whatever else. So I sort of didn't. Um, but then it found me, I found myself thinking, well, what am I going to do with an evening? So I would DJ a lot up in the lodge, but I found myself more and more and more. Alan would be down here and he'd be working late and he'd be sort of just grafting, grafting, grafting. And eventually I was like, Alan, you know, is there anything I can help out with? Is there anything I can do? Is it this or that? And da da da. So then eventually I started doing more evening work and I'd just be helping Alan with a multitude of tasks. Anything he had on, I would try and take a little bit and help him out a bit. Um, and that didn't go unnoticed. Kev had come down of an evening, like he often does. He'd come mm. down, see Alan, and then he'd be like, who the fuck's that in there? And I was like, oh, it's Reedy. Yeah, Reedy's still working away. And it was like that obviously got noticed that like, oh, he's here and he's grafting and he wants to put in the shift. Um, and yeah, from that, it was like, right, we're going to bring you up from basically, you don't have to work in the warehouse anymore. We want to bring you in alongside Alan and Kev. So um, yeah, I was in Kev's office working with essentially just with Alan and Kevin again. So same sort of thing, taking a bit off of Alan. And yeah, that progressed from the warehouse to then being sort of a marketing assistant, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Like back then really there wasn't, there weren't really a marketing team. There weren't really, Alan, Kev, Gary, that was like it. That was the team. So yeah, there wasn't that much of a marketing team. So yeah, I would come, I came in then and it was sort of my role was to, essentially look after a team of field testers team of consultants and deal with magazines so um yeah making sure we had product reviews in there competitions there this that the other so yeah that was generally that was my role for yeah a good few years can't remember how long but. was that a bit more you exciting yeah yeah what it was you- it was a bit more it was definitely a step in the right direction um it was different every day so i didn't just have the same job every single day so that was better in that respect it was more exciting um but then i guess i got to like at first it was really exciting i was buzzing right sweet i'm moving my way up and then it kind of got to a 
I guess I was like 19-ish, 20 by this time. Um, I think that's about right. So I'd got to this point and Nash was now starting to expand. It was starting to grow and there was more people coming in and there was like, now we had, yeah, there was more people doing marketing, more people doing photography and this and that and whatever else. So there was more people coming in. It was growing. It was going in the right direction. Um, And the long and short of it really is they needed someone that cared like that really cared and wanted to make it their life and do you know what i mean you needed someone that was devoted to the marketing manager's job of market nash market nash market nash like and that was not me at that time like it just wasn't and we had a yeah alan had a real sort of honest conversation with me there was no hard feelings or anything it was just like you don't want to do this anymore do you and i was like not really mate like what did you talk, talk to me a little bit more about why that wasn't right? Because you said there throughout college, the goal was to get a job at Nash. You've got a job at Nash. You've then progressed to more of a, a sort of suited role for yourself in the sense that it's not the same stuff every day. And then everything's built up. There's a long term picture, really, isn't there? I mean, yeah. look it out. Like, there's a long term picture. Why has that not been like right, I'm just going to stay here, do what I need to do and, and sort of carry on. What what was the, the factor or the thought process that said, no, nah, I don't really want this enough and, and I'm off? Was there anything in the back of your mind that you wanted to do or, or what? Yeah, Ibiza. Really? <laughs> no, it wasn't really. Well, it kind of was. It was like at that time I was, yeah, I was finally old enough to get into nightclubs and i was just and and when you worked here five days a week and it was like fishing 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 come the weekend i didn't i didn't want anything to do with fishing i wanted to go out and party and like see my mates and this and that and yeah that kind of party scene as such was more i was more living for the weekend than i was the weeks where i had to come to work and it was and that was kind of where al's point was coming from that at that time, Alan had not that he's hung his shoes up now for as such, but it's he he he'd sort of done his younger party in years mm. and was like, right now I've got a goal. I want this. I want that. I want a family. I want da 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 da. Yeah. So he was ready to just buckle down and do the work. Whereas I was still like, nah, I don't want to do all the work just yet. I want to party and I want to live. And I mean, I was young. I was young and just yeah naive at the time. So that was really. Yeah, that was the the bottom line of it. It was like they needed someone that just really cared, whereas I didn't. I just didn't. A different stage of your life, like you yeah. said, just there to the people that are involved at the top end of things, which I get. Along this time, you've obviously sort of not moved because you said you're still based at home in, in Bedford, but you're down in Essex a lot. Yep. You're fishing. What did that look like? We talked about Cavagnac. Obviously, there's the odd session on the church as well. Yeah, something I talk about. But in terms of, was there a, a venue or anywhere that you you sort of had as a mainstay while you were? So while I was down here, um, I was limited in that I couldn't drive. So I basically, when was I? How old was I? Can't remember. I pro- I probably passed my test when I was like my driving test. This is maybe. I don't know, maybe 18, 19, I think. Mm. Um, my memory's not that great, as you can tell. But, <laughs> um, um, yeah, so I passed my test, and then I could sort of venture out a little bit. So um, did a little bit over Baysies on the day ticket water, like just odd sessions here and there. But then sort of thought, right, I need to get into somewhere and, um, yeah, get stuck into somewhere as such. Uh, and there's a little water up at... Uh, What's it called? It's up by sort of Colchester Way, um, called Lakelands. So I'd seen a few pictures. Um, I know a lot of the Corder boys had fished it, and they'd sort of there's some nice fish in there. So um, I thought, right, I'll try and get a ticket on there. And actually, at the time, Terry Edmonds was working for Nash, right? And his old man was like head bailiff at this particular syndicate, Lakelands. So um, I spoke to Terry. Said, look, can you have a word? Get us in, and he'd managed to get us a ticket on there. So. Um, yeah, that was good. I enjoyed it. It was, um, I didn't get on so well first season. It was like a bit slow and I weren't really getting amongst them. Um, caught a couple, caught a few along the way. Um, and then I got Tommy to come over actually on a guestie. 
I was like, Tommy, come over, come and have a look, see if you like it. Done the old blag. Yeah, yeah, he's going to come down, take some photos. It's for this, it's for that. So, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So, Tommy had come over and um, while he was there, I actually caught uh, one of the targets, second biggest in a lake, I think, common, called Swirly. I think I had it about 38 pounds, something like that. How'd you have uh, that then? Uh, that was... Um, I was sat in a peg for, I'm not seeing nothing here, and I don't really fancy it. Like, I'm going to go for a little mooch round. I wound the rods in, had a little wander round, sort of got round to the back. No, nothing in there. Gone up a tree up the far end, nothing in there. Back to the swim, I was sort of scratching my head a bit, thinking, well, I ain't really seen nothing to move on, so I'm not going to move for the sake of moving. I'll just, you know, sit it out. So I sort of just sat, and I'm thinking, right, two rods back out on the spots they were, and I'm just looking out at the island, and I see just the odd sort of pinprick bubbles coming up, and I'm thinking, is that, is it a carp, is it not a carp? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. A few casts later, like, obviously I've put it in a tree a couple of times and all the rest of it, like, um, yeah, as you do. So, yeah, a few casts later, I finally managed to get a rig, like, pretty much on the on its, uh, on this spot where I'd seen the bubbles. And, yeah, it weren't long. It was, like, 25 minutes, half hour later. That one's just belted off and, yeah, decent battle. I've got some good pictures of that, actually, I think, somewhere. Um, yeah, Tommy got loads of good shots for me, like yeah. action shots and whatever else. And then... Yeah, that was probably, I think that was like the first one of the proper, the A-team, if you like. That was the first one of the A-team and I just so just so happened managed to have Tommy there on hand to get some decent pictures and stuff. So, yeah, that was a bit of a, yeah, a, bit of a fluky touch, really. Good timing, mate. Yeah, on, man. on there, the, the sort of size of the water and type of fishing... Talk to me a little bit about that at the time. Um, so it wasn't, it weren't massive. It was oh, off the top of me. I'd have a rough guess at it being like seven, eight acres. I might be way out there, but it's, yeah, a rough size. It weren't massive. Um, had a couple of islands in it. Um, one sort of area behind one of the islands known as the Back Bay and sort of, yeah, that was almost a renowned area. All the big and always come from the back bay. Oh, the back bay. Single scale, always from the back bay. And it was like, right, okay. So um, funnily enough, actually, I'll go back to the back bay in a minute. But yeah, so fairly weedy. Um, yeah, it was fairly weedy. Just And then had like odd little silt patches here and there and just clear areas that, um, yeah, it wasn't difficult fishing. Like mm. I say, I don't get suckered into rigs or baits. It was... Just make sure it's not in the weed and fire a load of boilies over it and hope that you catch something like that's <laughs> generally my philosophy. So, um, yeah, the fishing wasn't that difficult. There was quite a few in there. Like, I had a good backup stock of 20 pounders and the odd 30. And then there was these two, uh, single scale and swirly, the common that were like should have gone 40 at the right time of year. Um, so yeah, it was good. It was like, right, cool, got some nice targets, got some nice fish to go for. And uh, going back to the back bay, I remember being, um, I remember going for a walk around there and I thought, I'm going to get some bait in somewhere and then I'm coming back in a couple of days' time. So I've gone around to the back bay and I think this looks good. Like, this looks really good. So I've put a lead out. Oh, yeah, lovely clean area there. It's about 25, 30 yard. Just the right distance for a long range throwing handle with a spoon. Nice. So got the spoon, got a bucket of 20 millers. I'm thinking they're having it. <laughs> They're having it, like, good three kilo light in a big bucket. So I've, I'm there scooping it in, filling it in, and it's raining with 20 millers, <laughs> right, raining. And then um, Neil Spooner pops up just behind me in the swim where I'm filling it in. Hello, mate, are you, uh, are you fishing? I went, uh, no, 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 mate, I'm just uh, just baiting. Uh, I'm going to come back in a couple of days. He went, oh, right, I've... Uh, my uh, my quiver's in the swim next door. I'm about to fish. Oh, no. Oh, disastrous. So I'd walked round. I'd looked in the swim. I'd looked into the swim there, but not seen anything. He'd laid his rod down bag, like his rod bag, down at the back of the swim. I'd not seen it. Otherwise, obviously, I wouldn't have gone in and absolutely leathered it in. <laughs> and poor old Spooner's just like, yeah, cheers, mate. Nice one for that. He's a lovely bloke, though. Oh, he, he is. Yeah, like... he was sound. He was sound. He actually wrote about that in one of his little um, telling tales chapters. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't name me, fortunately, but he did. Oh, he did say, it, "Oh, it was horrendous." And at the time, I obviously thought, "Oh shit, I know who he is as well." Like, what, what did that? you do? did you carry? You couldn't have carried on putting. Oh, it no, no, I 
run off with my tail between my legs. I'm ever so sorry, Mr. Spooner. Like it I've was done um, three ki- three kilos. Oh yeah, I might as it well in. do ten. Filled it in, <laughs> filled it in, and it weren't it, it weren't even discreet. It was like twenty millers, and you know the noise they make. Do you know what I mean? Oh. It was ah, uh, it was horrendous. So, you just um, want the ground to swallow you up, mate. I did, yeah, I did. So um, good angling though. Well, you know, he still went on and caught them all as he course, always does. So. Of course he did, but he didn't catch him that session from <laughs> no, that. No, I don't think he did actually. As it goes, so. <laughs> Oh dear! But in terms of other captures on there that stand um, out, you've had Swirly, mega. Yeah, had Swirly, and then sort of the following year, I'd got into a bit of a swing of it and started to realise, right, okay, yeah, I can catch them now. Um, and then it all sort of really come together in a final sort of two week stint towards the end. Um, well, towards the end of when I was fishing it. So second year, I've caught a few of the other targets at sort of mid thirties, um, and I was thinking, yeah, this is all right. I'm getting the hang of it now. And then um, when Monster Squid Purple came about and it was actually on test, we had like the first samples with it. And uh, similar story again, I'm down there with my long range throwing handle and my fucking th- and my 20 millers. I'm like, right, they're having it. So basically there was this one sort of end of the lake, if you like, where there's a bay up here, you couldn't fish there. And there's a swim here and then there's a swim on the far bank sort of opposite it. And, and then down to your right or left, depending which side you were, was this bay. Down in the bay, you could always see the big one. As soon as the sun come out, it was in the same spot all the time. It would just, you'd get up a tree and it'd be there sunbathing. You could cast it, you could put zigs at it, you could float a fish for it. It would not eat there, mm. but it lived there. And I was like, right, okay, I know where it lives, sweet. So then I've gone to both sides of the bay and there's a big band of weed, like 25 yardish out off, the, off each bank. Um, I filled it in standard, like just filled it in with purple squid, like both about three key on each side of it. Um, I thought I'm going to come back in a couple of days. And then like in this time, I've then got back down to the lake, started catching a couple and then people are coming along and they're like, something weird's going on. Something weird's going on. I'm like, what? what's that? They're like, everything's shit in purple. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, no. And at this time, it's like strictly, no, don't tell anyone that we're like doing a purple bait or anything yeah, like that. So it's yeah. all hush hush. And uh, I was like, no, nah, nothing to do with me. Don't know what you're on about. And I was like, are you sure it was purple? I don't think it was. And then it weren't just the fish that were shitting purple, like ducks were shitting yeah. purple, swans were at it as well. I was like, oh, no. I so, think they're really ill. Don't fish for them. Yeah, don't, don't fish for them don't at this fish stage. For them, especially not in this area where <laughs> it went on for a couple of weeks. After I'd filled it in, I'd managed to get back there and um, <clears throat> I was I was basically doing an overnight, I straight back to work, do as I say as little amount of work as I could, but mm. basically get my work done as quickly as I possibly could, back out the door, straight back down there. And I did it consecutively for like probably 10, 12 nights. A but they were in one swim and it was like in that swim that I'd sort of um that I'd baited heavily and they were just off the front of the weed. And ev- I'd have like two a night, then three a night, then it was four a night. And every morning I'd put another couple of kilo in and then like back to work and go back same thing again and it just progressed i got a lot of repeat captures in that two weeks sort of caught loads of the ones i already had um and it was just a a matter of time i thought it's going to happen like it is and sure enough yeah it did happen um yeah i caught single scale the other like the remaining big one that i wanted at 39 and 39 12 39 13 pb at the time pb at the time yeah so it was just shy of 40 um and i was lucky again tommy was actually fishing the opposite bank he'd got a ticket at this point so tommy started fishing it he was on the opposite bank so yeah for both of the big ones out of there i had tommy there on the camera which was yeah a touch so that's good story always join a lake with a good cameraman friend present it's essential yeah yeah that's brilliant from you well done from there, we've talked about Nash and being a part of it. I'm well. I know you've had opportunity, even though limited opportunity, over the course of your time in that first in at Nash to fish the church. Talk to me about your uh, experiences fishing that because that is pretty much like fishing Cavagnac, but smaller and in the UK. Yeah, yeah, it was. It is. Um, yes, I mean back then as well. When when I was here the first time, it was. It was different to it is to what it is now. Mm. It's like it didn't get fished regularly. It didn't have people on it every single week. It was back then. It was more. 
it was more week on week off so it would be and it would be pretty much invite only it would be who kev wanted here so it was you know friends or people in the trade or our consultants or filming work or whatever um so yeah it was different back then um and i got the odd session here and there it was like as i'm sure a lot of the boys have said on the podcast it was like you get you you get your opportunity he gives you the little treat and he's like yeah go on you can have a weekend um and I think one of the, in fact, the first time I fished it, I fished it with Al. Um, he battered it and I caught one, <laughs> which wasn't the best weekend. Well, it was, it was great. It was really good. Um, but it was, um, yeah, could it, I was sitting there thinking, come on. I think I had a 28 pounder, not one of the real lookers. It had like a weird little lump on its face. It was one called the hammerhead, actually. It was, uh, <laughs> hammerhead. Because it had this weird little flap on the side of its face and it was like, you know, all right, yeah, sweet. That's all right at 28 pound. But then Alan had had like the big common, the big leather, the big fully, all at over 40. I was like, come on, when is my time coming? But um, yeah, that was one of the first sessions we fished it. That was really good. Um, and then over the time, like I say, it was when... <clears throat> friends came up or consultants or whatever and because my role at the time was looking after the consultants it would be very much of a weekend or you know they might be coming up friday to sunday um nashi would sort of say yeah you can look after the anglers but six and rods out while you're up there so <clears throat> that was the basis of my fishing up there whilst i was here like the first time i was here at nash so um yeah i had some good sessions up there some good ones i remember we were fishing with billy flowers back in the day yeah Yeah. billy and jamie that was a good crack we had a real good weekend caught a few um yeah who other who else do i have good trips with up there um steve renyard and sort of all the boys that were there sort of back in there sort of fishing for us back at the back then um yeah i just sort of yeah mooched about and just caught a few here and there but again didn't really catch loads of the big ones i just caught loads of the small pretty ones that's been a good host though isn't it mate really well you know i I thought you know i I won't catch the big ones boys i want you to have a (laughs) good trip that's how it goes you know nice from you mate and then you talked and we talked i've skipped everywhere here mate randomly but we talked about you then having that conversation with al leaving nash but on on good terms in terms of it everybody knew what it was going to become and and that wasn't for you at that stage in your life from there and this is probably where i sort of got to not well got to know you was you found your way and i want you to talk me through how you found your way into the whole northern angling show event side of of the trade was there anything in between that or or, no no straight in yeah it was straight in and it came about so as i mentioned i looked after the team of anglers um and jamie klossick was one of our anglers at the time yeah um who he would come up fish the church and he was obviously a house dj so he was into the music as well Mm. so he'd come up to the lakes um, we'd have the decks there sort of for most of the guests we'd be like all oh, right guests are fishing like music off we won't play music this week and sort of just be a bit respectful Klossy could come up and be like get the tunes on straight away <laughs> do you know what I mean he was yeah. like yeah definitely get the tunes on so um yeah instantly we sort of hit it off got on like a house on fire so I was good mates with Jamie anyway as well as sort of colleagues if you like sort of working for well he was fishing for us and I was looking after them as the anglers so we were good mates anyway I'd had this chat with Alan and then sort of um yeah had a chat with Jamie on the phone one day and he basically said like what's up you don't sound like you don't sound yourself you don't sound fully yourself you sound a bit now I basically explained oh you know think my time is coming to an end and like me and Alan have had a chat and I need something to do and he basically said um well we me and Spenny Lee the other chap that's involved with um the Northern Angling show he sort of said you know we've got we've got a show that we're we're basically just launching um and we you know there might be a role for you do you want to come up and have a chat and I was like yeah that sounds all right mm. um I'd met Spenny I'd met Spenny once before at this point. We'd been to uh, Cudmore Fisheries. Do you remember that? Do you remember when the great, what was it called? The great angling, great British angling show or something. And they held the Fishermania finals. Fishermania, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was that. And they had like a big show tied in with it. So we were there as Nash, like doing an event. And as always, we had decks and whatever else for the (laughs) evening. Like everyone had gone home, all the punters. And we're like, we're not going to sit around here, like drinking tea, like, 
let's smash some beers and get the decks out. So we did that. And yeah, sure enough, Spenny come down, Jamie come down. And um, yeah, there was all the Nash boys there. So we had a good party. That was the first time I met Spenny. So going back to it, I've gone up, gone for a meeting, if you like, a meeting with Spenny and Jamie, which basically involved going to uh, Spenny's house in Manchester and Spenny and Jamie selling me the dream and they were like this is it this is what we can do yeah. we've got this venue we've got this idea we want to do like the best show in the country we want to smash it out da, 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 da. I was like oh this sounds like ace this sounds really good like I'm up for it and then um yeah that was it that was like an hour long chat I think meeting meeting was over um we went out got on the beers went to warehouse project and that was like Jeez, and that was where right. it all started so lads, was, lads, 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 lads. lads yeah that was basically it so it come about from that that was like the uh that was my uh, was that the start of all that that was my initiation was basically yeah let's have a, a quick chat and then go out top boys yeah I've spent, right. like i think spenny the first time i met spenny properly was on Eric's Willows and he'd caught two forties. Yeah, and yeah. And that night, I caught a forty. He did my pictures. Absolute boy, yeah. lovely bloke. And Jamie, like brilliant podcast, the Carp Cast. Yeah, Absolutely yeah, very brilliant. good. Like, at it. Day one, original OG Megra. I used to listen to it all the time. Him and Mark. And then I he did some work at Clearwater. He did some work at Clearwater yes. promotional stuff on that, and also came down and did some video work there. But another, like, absolute boy. So two good ones there, mate. Yeah, man. And one of them, as I say, was, like, an already a good mate. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it was like, yeah, sweet. I can walk into something were you, that... Were you ever apprehensive about getting into sort of a professional role with with one mate at the time or not? Uh, no, not really. No, okay. it was like, yeah, sweet. This sounds like fun. Um, I liked the idea of... Um, yeah, I like the idea that I was still in the fishing industry as such, like in a different role, but it was more, I'm going to be working for myself. It's a bit more self-employed. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, there was that. And I think the other, I mean, there was another, another aspect to it, to it as well was I sort of thought, I, I, I love the music and I love the party inside of it. That was kind of why I needed to leave Nash. Going into the Northern Angling show, Spenny also runs a very successful event brand, Kaluki. So yeah. he does a lot of house music events. Um, and that was not a, a carrot as such, but they were basically, you know, I thought, well, there's a chance to get involved here as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was like, this is cool. I can work with someone that does something really cool that I like anyway, the music side of it. And we're going to get to do a fishing event and sort of do our own thing as well and build something. So that was like the two real reasons for it. And, uh, yeah, it was as simple as that. I think I went up for that meeting and then sort of came back down. And within a day or two, I was like, yeah, sweet, right, let's have it. And then, yeah, said to Al, I was like, Al, I think like, you know, your problem's sorted. You don't need to worry about me not being the right person now. I've got something else to go and do. And he was like, oh, buzzing, perfect. Like, not because he wanted me gone, like he did, but he also was like, sweet, you've got something that you're yeah, going to go and you're do. Sorted. You're going to enjoy it. Um, Nashi was really good as well. I was like, really, I, I always remembered it that <clears throat> in all the years that I went away and did the NAS and whatever, um, I remember Nashi taking me aside on the uh, veranda out the back there and he just said, not that I think it will, but should it all go wrong, yeah. you can always come back. And that was like, what more can I ask for? Do you know what I mean? I can yeah. go away, and even if it all goes wrong, I can always fall back. So it's like you just know it was it was going to be sweet, you know. So yeah, that was um, yeah that was how we got into the NAS really. And that chapter, like in terms of, I suppose it's exactly what you want. You, I perceive it, and please correct me if I'm wrong you've got the freedom there to sort of manage your own schedule. You obviously got to deliver the Northern Angling show. Incredible. Like was the best show. Thank like, you. Will be again. If it happens again, we'll talk about that when it happens. Um, but I get the feeling that that was a lot less intensive on your time. Not when it's on, there's a bit of build up and getting everything arranged, but you had a bit more freedom with regards to what you wanted to do and, and just general life. Yes or no? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. That was like, it was, I won't say six months on six months off. Cause it wasn't quite that. It was, it was, it was intense for six months. Mm. Like that was when it was like, right fun stops, no fishing, no partying. I locked myself in an office, not much bigger than this. And get it done. 
just make sure it happens. Um, but then, like you say, it was manage your own time. So if I did need to have a couple of days off or if the pressure dropped and there was a big southwesterly, sweet, I can go and do a couple of nights because there wasn't there wasn't anyone else really relying on me or it wasn't like, yeah. Yeah, day to day. Yeah, yeah. we're in a day to day. You've got to be in the office. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. It was like just, uh, I work like, I work better in the evening in my own time, sort of really? like way better. I'm what not. What are we talking evening? What time? And it can be in the busy periods of the show, like until I can't keep my eyes open no more. Like, I will happily work then, but you try and get me up at six in the morning, no chance. He's not a morning person. Don't do mornings, mate. Don't do, like, don't talk to me for two hours. That's why you said no to 8 a.m. this morning. Correct, Hassan. Correct. 8 a.m. 8 a.m. in here, and you want me to sit and talk to you and be all bubbly. I'm there. Not having it. I love a morning. No. I'm the other way. I'd struggle at like. No. Evening, much better. I'd rather sleep in and then do everything in the evening. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. just when I work better. My head works better. My brain functions. It's just, yeah, it's just difference of, yeah, I don't know what it is, difference of people, difference of your body clock, whatever. Yeah, yeah, but, it's just what's, what's for you, isn't it? What works. Fishing in that time. Yeah. So we, we you still based in, you, know, you must have moved from Essex. Are you back in Bedfordshire? No. So I went from Essex uh, and moved straight up to Blackpool was where I went. So, oh my boy! Oh gosh! Yeah, Black that was um, yeah, that was uh, an experience. That was where Klossick lived. So Klossick was um, he was staying at a mate's house, or he was staying at um, a house where, or he had the option to move to a house where one of his mates had gone travelling. Um, he okay. said, "Can you look after the house for us and whatever while I'm away?" So Klossick and his missus moved into there, um, and Klossick's house was empty. So he was like, "Look, I can put you up for." you know, the foreseeable just to get you up here so you can be working on the job. So kind of as part of the NAS bundle was we'll cover your rent and bills. Like you, and as you can imagine, it was its first year. We didn't know whether it was going to make any dough or mm. like whether it was even going to be able to cover wages, etc. So I wasn't on a massive wage. It was like, sweet, we'll pay you this and we'll cover your rent and bills. I was like, well, sweet, that's all right. I can live and have a go at doing something new um and yeah everything's covered as such so yeah moved up to blackpool um and i was there for gotta have been a couple years at least yeah maybe two three years possibly i think um and then after that eventually moved over to sort of bolton and in well in between yeah basically just outside bolton and manchester um, You're near my yard now, then. Where are there. you from? Well, I don't know if I should say on this podcast in case someone could... Give I'm us like a rough area. North Manchester, mate, like north of oh, like right, okay. Berry Way. Oh. Berry Bolton is, like, pretty close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So me and Spenny were out there. I moved in with Spenny. Um, he basically oh. had to move out of a place in town, and I wanted to move out of Blackpool. So, yeah, we ended up getting somewhere together. Um, and it was just a bit closer to Manchester. Obviously, yeah. I wanted to get more involved with um, the Kaluki stuff and the music. So I was like, yeah, this sounds good, sweet. So, um, yeah, moved to there. And that was kind of Manchester was where it was. I just needed to be up there for most of it. I was back and forth from the venue a lot. And yeah. in the earlier days of it, it was like trying to, well, just learn how to run a show. Do you mm. know what I mean? It was, um, yeah, I'd never done anything like it. It was mental. It was absolutely mental starting out like, right, what what do we do? It was um yeah. It was but I suppose you've got you've got some fishing contact with regards to that side of stuff. But yeah. The event side of stuff is like uh, the event side of it was a blank canvas. That mm. was mental. Like I remember the venue saying to us, um on the first ever week of it, they were like, So uh, who's coming to do your mark out? And I went, Mark who? Mark out? Mark mark out and they were like, Yeah, you know, like as in someone comes in and marks out where all the stands are gonna go so everyone knows where to build everything and I was like don't know, mate. Some yeah. don't know. Get me a piece of chalk, boy. Well but basically <laughs> I actually did do it with a piece of chalk and uh there was a bit of a running joke we had for years. I used like a, a half of a 30 centimetre ruler that I'd like s- snapped somehow. And that, I'm not kidding you, that that ruler was responsible for pretty much every floor plan I ever drew for that event, ever. <laughs> because I knew the scales, I knew how many centimetres were metres and whatever else. And yeah, basically I did it all off of a ruler. And then that first time pretty much was, let's get a bit of chalk and like measure it out. 
Yeah, it was, um, yeah, we had no idea, no idea. But then same with everything. You just start and go, right, we'll just do it the best we can and see how it goes. Why do you think, and this is a massive, I think it's a tough question. Why do you think that show was so mega? Is it because, and again, this is probably me being from the North, adopted Northerner now. Is it because that the North tends to get neglected with regards to, because a lot of the brands are Essex based or Southern based. You've obviously got the Colm Valley, the Lee Valley. You've got a lot of sort of proper carpy territory, if you like, down South. Conversely, you've obviously got Reedsmere and the likes of up North as well, but that tends to get overlooked in terms of the base for brands. Do you think the reason that it was so successful, the Northern England shows is because of location or do you think it was something that you created above the other shows that were present at the time down down south? Um, I think the location was a big, big, big part of it. Um, like you say, it was neglected. Um, key thing being that we, well, Jamie and Spenny actually did it before I started there. They'd identified being anglers from the north, they would come down and work at the shows in the south. Mm. Well, it's on a bad run it's five hours if you get stuck in traffic and then you stop off at the services and you get a burger and you do whatever and before you've done 100 quid before you even get to a show in the south so northerners just didn't have that they didn't have anything there was no competition and it was like sweet we've got a an amazing venue that was superbly located it was perfect it was like good access loads of food and drink over the road like mm. it was just the perfect spot for it so um that in conjunction with the fact that they've just never had a show like that before or they had to travel a long way to get to something like that i'd say that is a big big part of it um so that was that that combined with the fact that because they never had anything or they never had another show to go to their spend wasn't diluted. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So people would save up. I used to watch it on all the Facebook channels and everything. It'd be like, oh, I'm saving. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. I'm going to get X, Y, Z at that show. Mm -hmm. So from a retail point of view, it was great because lots of people would come and they would come to spend money. So it was great. So everyone was happy. Punters were happy because they'd come and it'd be like, wow, we've got our own show and it's a good one in the North and the retailers and the brands would be happy because they'd come see loads of people and get to sell a load of gear. So it worked for, for both, um, it worked for both parties in that respect. I think the only thing that we, that we probably did differently was, um, this will come down to again, sort of Spenny's uh, music industry influence, should we say? He's helped sort of produce big events for thousands and thousands and thousands of people at festivals and whatever else. So we sort of come in, and um, in the past, I mean, Carpinom is the only exception. They had a bit of a stage and a feature area as such, yeah. um, and we sort of kind of did a similar thing, but we brought in a big sound system, a big LED screen, loads of lights, made it look fancy and a bit of a. Ooh, and Oh, do you know what I mean? It was something a bit shiny and a bit special. Um, and we probably paid attention to um, like the branding and how it, yeah. how it looked and how it felt. Like we spent a lot of money on stuff that um, that we didn't really need to, but it just made it look nice. It looked shiny. It looked like a well presented product, the show as a whole. And I think that probably added to it as well, that it wasn't sort of, yeah, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't middle of the road. It was like, this is the top end. Like, let's do everything as best we can. We probably could have made a load more dough out of it, but we decided to make it the best show that we possibly could. And that was, that probably added to it a little bit. But like I say, I think the key thing is the fact that it was unique for the area. And I dare say Northerners are friendlier than Southerners in general. Mm. And they're more, they're more buzzing and happy and receptive to to the brands like they're keen do you know what i mean i'd yeah. watch people chew people's ears off on stands because they want to they want to absorb all the information they want to learn and and i've been to the southern shows and it's a bit there's definitely an element of like what are you going to teach me like i already know it i already fish a syndicate with 50 pounders in it I don't need to hear from you do you know what i mean there's a little bit of that whereas like northerners are they're keen. They're really keen and they're more receptive to take it on. So I think all of them little bits together 
probably, yeah, it, it just, um, they all together added to what it turned out to be. So, yeah, it was good. Yeah, but mate, they were brilliant. I, um, they, yeah, not just because I was a northerner, they, they were brilliant. All shows are brilliant because it's nice to have a melting pot of people. But as you say, it was different. It was a different vibe. It was different all, all around. In terms of running the shows, obviously that there's no two ways about it. Like you guys were rushed off your feet, pretty stressed, and it was pretty full on. Talk to me about sort of maybe some of the um, some of the stories with regards to the things that people wouldn't have seen at the show that were going on behind the scenes. Ah, oh, there's some. There was like, so, yeah, the first ever one that we did, we had, we'd verbally agreed uh, that we could get in on Thursday, I think it was. And uh, I look on, uh, I look on the website of the week of the event and this is, before I'd come in, Jamie and Spenny had verbally agreed with the guy. There was a, there was a bloke that ran the venue at the time, Mm. Andy, I can't remember his name, um, and he was a nightmare for, oh, yeah, 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 that'll be fine. That'll be fine. No props. No props. So he's told us, yeah, you can be in there Thursday. Not a problem. You can get billed in. So we've, like, told everyone, yeah, turn up Thursday. We're there. We're building Thursday. No props. Like, week of the event, I go onto Event City's website. And I'm like, boys, there's an electronics show in the in our hall all day Thursday. Oh, dear. Not the best start. So oh. yeah, that was that was an an interesting one, and it was like right, okay, what we're we gonna do here? So I've run the venue. They're like right, well, we can get you in from like ten p.m. All right, yeah, great, excellent. Everyone's yeah, expecting yeah. to turn up at eight a.m. So I've had to tell everyone, don't come until the following day. The contractors, they're like, well, we need to build everyone's mm. stand. Da, 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 da. We need to get in and build a pond, like, and start cracking on, laying things out. This is where mark out came about, like do the mark out with a ruler and a bit of like chalk and whatever else. Do you know what I mean? It was so like, um, yeah, so unprepared, but yeah, we basically that first year we worked through the night, got in at 10, um, shifted like, I don't know, hundred railway sleepers, put a pond liner in, started filling a pond with a garden hose pipe and oh. stuff that you, we just not even ever, when it's your first go it's your yeah. first, and you don't really get a test rehearsal. It's just like, right, go. You're in. So, yeah, that was one of the little things that happened behind the scenes. Um, one of my favourites is Classic Burst in the uh, the fire hydrant. That was good. I enjoyed that. We when were, did that So happen? this is as we'd evolved and we knew what we were doing a bit more. We were like, we can't use a garden hose to fill the pond. Yeah, we, yeah. We're going to use the fire hydrant outside. So we've got a big fire hose on it. And somehow Classic had gone out and man- managed to... Um, basically pop the hose off of the fire hydrant whilst it's in full flow Ooh. tanking and then i'm not kidding you there's a fountain in the car park 25 foot high Ooh, foot, mega. just tanking and the car park's flooding Cl- classics <laughs> like in there trying to do it he's blown his glasses off his face because of the force of the water saturated um yeah that was a good one what else i can't remember what about in shows any like in shows um any nightmares? Any security like thieves? I've seen a few little runners uh, when you, I was there. You That's get hard. you get a few. There's a few. Um yeah, I know Ryan, one of our good friends, Spenny's um cousin, he sort of I call him the head of security. Ryan was the head of security. He did not like thieves at all and i'd seen him he chased a few out of the car park and he got stuff back as well he did, did pretty he? good oh yeah chased them like got them against the fence like took their whatever they'd nicked off of him and like brought it back to the stand holders um yeah you, it's one of them you get a few and yeah. it and again that was something that at first it was probably a free-for-all for them because we had no like measures in place we didn't really know what to do if mm. something like that happened then we adopted this um system whereby anything sold has to have a tag on it and yeah. da, 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 da. that improved it significantly it become a lot more difficult for them to uh yeah, for him to get away with it. So yeah, we kind of felt like we got on top of that a bit. But yeah, Ryan was our Ryan was our head of security, um, along with Roger, Roger Bacon. Yeah, sort of, yeah, right. he'd be there, sort of helping out as well. But yeah, other than that, in show, in show, I don't think we ever had too many disasters. It was all right. It was like it was more in the build ups. There would be logistical nightmares and errors and stuff like that. But mm, yeah, but nothing that you can't overcome. Like I say, from 
an outsider's perspective, you would never have known that no. Jamie flooded the car park or this happened or that happened or we couldn't get in the venue or that it, like it all just went ahead as if it should be. So No, you smashed it. A brilliant show. Well they will be again, mate. Brilliant yeah. show. Like mega. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. I did enjoy every single one of them. It was like in the build up it was stress. It was like mm. I don't like this anymore. I don't want to do it again. But then come nine o'clock Saturday morning when the doors open, you're like and brief. It was good. Worth it. Yeah, man, it was good. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Now, looking back over the time when you were involved um, with NAS, your angling, you had a bit more availability of time. Where did it take you? So, yeah, like I said before, it was um, it was busy for like six months. There was another few months either side of the show where it was sort of downtime if you like it was um and then yeah as you say that gave me a lot more freedom um to go on the fishing trips that i wanted so and i think as i mentioned earlier when i was talking about cavignac um boat fishing i like it it's it's a bit of me it's like i'm not the best caster i don't like spotting at 110 yards to a dinner play it's not for me like i would rather go out with a boat with an echo finder with a little engine and sort of explore really so um yeah off the back of that i sort of looked for those kinds of trips and uh a notable one would have been um, Gravier's. We went out to there. Spenny and Jamie had been um, before. Uh, they'd been out a couple of times before, I think. And um, we, they basically, Spenny had another trip booked um, for July, I think it was. Yeah, sort of middle of July or early July. Um, and we kind of saw it as a bit of a let's go as a NAS team trip kind of thing. So me, Spenny and Jamie went out to Gravier's. Is this at the time when Scar's still still knocking about? Yeah, Scar was still about at that time. Um, And to be honest, when we went, I didn't really know anything about it at all. Like, Spenny and Jay were just like, it's got a 90-pounder, it's got an 80-pounder, and it's got a load of other hippos. So I was just like, sign me up, yep, let's go. (laughs) So yeah, sweet, I'm in. Um, So yeah, we went. um, It was difficult. It was difficult. There was uh, the circumstances surrounding it were we'd gone in July. The fish had or hadn't spawned. We're still not any wiser as to whether they had or not. So um, Luke, the owner, is very much about fish care. Um, Mm. He's very sort of um, he's got some rules in place. And when we went, he actually wasn't at the lake. Uh, for the beginning of the trip so it was just his bailiff out there so we've got there um and there was a number of fish at one end of the lake now personally i watched them down there and i wouldn't have said that they were grouping up to spawn there was no sort of chasing about they weren't like moving fast they were in groups but they were Mm. sort of sunbathing sitting in the edge etc etc it was hot anyway um luke for he had his own reasons he was like I think the fish are grouping up spawn. I don't want you to fish that end of the lake. So Is this when he came back or was this when this the bailiff... Is, he'd put this through the bailiff, basically. Okay. The crack is you can't fish that end of the lake, which is almost a bit like immediately from the off. We're like, oh, we ain't seen nothing up this end. Like we fish the point. Um, he also has another rule. You have to fish in pairs. So we couldn't split up. One of us couldn't go down the far end. So it was like, right, all three of us are going to have to go on the point. So we fish the point. Um, and we got into the swim, did a draw for swim. So, uh, I think Jamie come out of the hat first, um, Spenny second, me last. So Jamie had seen a lot of fish down to our right under the trees. Um, there was, there was a good few fish. So wise decision. He picked the right hand side of the point, fished over to that side. Spenny picked the left hand side of the point, which sort of fished into a bay to the left as such. And then that sort of left me with the far margin to myself sort of. Uh, so I fished the middle of the point. So, uh, as I said, there was rules in place. Um, Luke didn't want us to fish in the edge. Basically he didn't want us to fish anywhere within four rod lengths of the bank because he was convinced that the fish were using the margins they wanted to be in the margins because they were grouping up to spawn it was roasting it was the middle of the july all the fish were in the margins so it was tough no. it was like oh this is like and to be fair it in a way it did it kind of ruined the trip in the beginning because me and jamie were like this is just not 
it's not on. We can't fish for them. Like mm. we'd wake up every morning, look down the lake, and you'd see fifty shows like Badoosh, Badoosh, one after the other, loads of dollops, and we're just like, oh. what in that area you couldn't fish? Yeah, yeah, down the far end of the lake, and we're like, they're all down there. Like whether whether they were all down there because, as Luke said, he thought the fish were grouping up. He want and and they were going to spawn, so he didn't want anyone to disturb them and disperse the fish. He just wanted them to get it over and done with, get it done, which is fair play. That's there is fish. Like he wants to look after them. I personally think he'd sort of you know. Uh, he'd fought that for a couple of weeks, so there'd been a few trips before us as well that couldn't fish down that end of the lake. So okay. it kind of, to me, says that they were down there because they hadn't been fished for. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we fished the point, um, and Jamie was Jamie managed to actually catch one pretty quickly, a 58-pounder or something like that, which was decent start. Right, cool, we're off to a good start. Um yeah, he'd got the bite early doors, and then after that, it sort of went quiet. We didn't really see anything, um, nothing certainly in open water or in the deeper water where we could actually fish. So mm. it was like me and Jamie are like, let's pack up, we'll go home, we'll you know, we'll say, look, we didn't get to fish all the lake, we'll come back, or we want a discount, or whatever. So me yeah. and Jamie were a bit like let's just go. Like, if we can't fish for the fish, let's just go home. Spenny was completely the opposite. And he was like, no, come on. We're meant to be on a lad's holiday. We're meant to be enjoying ourselves. We've got to stay. We've got to stay. And this went on for a few days and it was like, should we go? Should we stay? Da, 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 da. And then um, I think one of the afternoons we had, we'd walked round to the far bank and we see the scar in the edge, like where you're sat there like right no. at our feet and we're like oh my god look <laughs> at the size of it it's ridiculous it is absolutely ridiculous um so we'd seen the fish and then that sort of lifted spirits a bit more we're like oh, well we've seen it it's not down the far end which mm -hmm. is a touch but it is in the edge so it's like okay right let's stay so <clears throat> As the week progressed, the weather cooled down a little bit. We are pecking the bailiff's head. We're like, tell Luke that they're not going to spawn. They're, they're all in the edge. Like, tell him, can we fish in the edge? We need to be able to fish in the edge. And, like, basically the bailiff had gone back to him, explained it all, and he said, yeah, okay, I don't want you to fish the far end of the lake, but you can now fish in the edge up your end of the lake. So oh, it's right. like, okay, step in the right direction. Step in the right direction. So, um, yeah, we've all sort of adjusted our rods i've now gone like tight to the far bank mm. and this was like tuesday and maybe wednesday i think so halfway through the week uh and yeah i'd put my rods on the far bank we're just having dinner on a wednesday evening um i think it just got dark we'd had a few beers and stuff and uh, i get a savage drop back on one of the rods i'm like i'm oh, straight in the boat out to it um played it in the boat yeah good battle and then up comes this this mirror um yeah a, a big long mirror absolute whacker monster i'm like buzzing this is nice come back to the bank i'm like boys yes i got a good one did you think it was it did you think it was scar well no i didn't think it was the scar but anything over 50 pound has to you have to call the bailiff ah. um so and all fish regardless of size i think oh is it yeah i think any fish regardless of size you do everything in the water mm. all the way in the lot so I get back to the bank, we're like, it's a whack eye, it's over 50, right, we better call the bailiff. So bailiff comes round, he looks in the net, he rolls it over, he goes, you got the brown fish? You got the brown? I'm like, no. I didn't know anything about the lake, so I'm like, what's the brown? Jamie That's and Spenny true. are jumping up and down going, it's 80 pounds, it's 80 pounds, it's an 80 pound, and they're jumping up and down, they're going absolutely nuts. So we get it out, <laughs> goes into the sling, we weigh it. It's 73 pound. I'm like, oh, shit, it's just gone from 80 to 73. Still buzzing, yeah, still absolutely, but mega, mega, mega. And then it's, oh, no, actually, we forgot to take the sling off as well. So, right, so it's gone from from 80, 80. to 73 to 60. Oh, no, it, no, it must have been 71, I think we'd thought it was, then took the sling off and it was 67. So I'm still like, wow. I mean, new PB, buzzing but it has just gone from 80 pounds to 67 so a bit of an anti-climax at this point but i'm buzzing we're like right sweet we can catch them now like there's fish up here they're in the edge great but it was actually the brown fish no it weren't the brown fish he, he just got it wrong sorry i should have included that bit. yeah <laughs> he, um yeah no he just got it wrong he'd just like mistaken it for a different fish and uh yeah it wasn't so it was um it was actually one that i think was called the long fish i think 
um yeah the long one something like that but yeah so that was like okay spirits are lifted a bit now like we, we can catch some there's some fish in the edge buzzing um so at this point i'm like well yeah i'm happy to stay lads you know yeah, it's good why not yeah, jamie will stay we'll stay my right, my, yeah. my tune has changed yeah to like do you know what i mean so um we carried on sort of carried on fishing and whatever else and then um it got to Thursday afternoon. So I think it must have been this same day. It was actually. So the Wednesday, as I said, we've gone for a walk around. We've seen the scar in the edge. Mm. I've then seen another fish, um, a big fish on my margin. I'm like, right, sweet. We can fish in the edge now. So I fished up to there, caught a real good one. I'm some, like buzzing with that. And uh, we've gone back to the swim. We're all over there. And then Thursday afternoon, just off of like where we'd seen the scar over in the right in the edge, um, about three, four rod lengths off the, off the bank. I think Closet must have been in his bivvy. Spenny was probably the same. Or we were both, everyone was like faffing about getting rods sorted and stuff. Mm. And Closet, I'm sorry if you're listening or like watching this, but I see the scar stick it set out. I see it come out, clean out. And the reason I apologised to Jamie was technically when we'd split the 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 sections up of where everyone's like boundaries were if you like yeah. jamie was on the right spenny on the left so reedy you've got that bit in the center there where i see the fish show was considerably further right than my water so or what we'd called my water and it was technically <laughs> in jamie's water but jamie had rightly so seen a lot of fish far far right so he'd swung all his rods around and he was fishing over there um yeah i see the big and stick its head out it's come out like an absolute shield um <laughs> it's just an, amazing i was like there's no question in what fish that was 100 uh, percent, it's it and i've sort of gone oh uh, jay if you're uh you're not putting any rods over there i think i might just you know just pop a rod over in that direction and jay being jay was yeah of course mate crack on no worries no worries so yeah boated on over there found like that was where we see it in the weed there and then just off the front of this weed was like a nice bit deep spot sort of nine ten foot something like that nice and clean i thought that would do lovely load of 20 millers on it my usual technique oh, cool. fill it in 20 millers big long daft rig on it like a 12 inch like massive rig bog standard knotless knot with a hook just a twister um <laughs> and that was it just like yeah that'll do me and um yeah so that was on the thursday afternoon friday morning Spenny must have been up already. I think he'd had a bream or a bite or something. So Spenny was up and my right hand rod, where I'd seen this big fish show, just hoops over on the pot. It goes over. So Spenny's already up and I'm like, right, up, out. And I've picked up the rod. And by the time I've picked it up, Spenny's like brought the boat straight round to me. Put like I've stepped into the boat, life jacket on, yeah, ready, good to go. And then yeah, so Spenny's like, as I've got in the boat, he's just patted me on the back and went, Go and get the scar, son. And I'll never, ever forget that they were the exact words he said. Go and get the scar. And then I've got out and lo and behold, I get out, get above the fish. It comes up and I see, shit, it's a big one. It's a, re <laughs> <laughs> it's a real big one. Yeah, it's big and there's that. It was, well, bigger than any fish I'd ever seen before. It was enormous. And then, yeah, that was sort of like, it come up and the first time I see it, I thought, it's oh, it's about the same size as the other one I had. Like, it's long, it's big, it's a good one. And then it come back across the side of the boat and it come directly underneath me, sort of looking down off the side of the boat and I see, like, the little dip in its back, this unmistakable, like, bit where the scar goes round mm. it. And I see the dip and at that point I'm like, shit, yeah, it's it. Oh, my God, it's it. And then two are on the back, like, they're, they're going, what you got, what is it, what is it, can you see it, what is it? And I'm just like, silence. Yeah. It's like, don't talk to me. I'm I can't hear you I'm now. concentrating don't talk to me so it was like it all become very serious and I think I think them two knew by yeah. the fact that I'd gone quiet what I'd hooked and it was like it wasn't it, to be honest I mean it gave me a good runabout it was in nice deep water clear there was no weed it was just tanking about and turning strangely enough it actually when I got above it I thought, oh, it's a small one. It was going like, like real tappy, real fast, like bouncing about. And I was like, what is that? actually going on? And I think when I'd watched it in the edge and seen it swim off, it takes like four, five, six good swishes of its tail to, get going. to even get moving. Yeah. And I just think it was down there just shaking its head, like rattling about. Um, and Adam got going. And then, but when it did, it was just like, 
tank in a way and just towing me about in the boat and uh yeah man it was like i don't know it seemed seemed like a lot longer but it was probably five ten minutes something like that just plodding about and then yeah first time missed it with the net no <laughs> missed it with the net Why did it just go again yeah like it was coming up and i went for it and oh. it sort of slid away in the boat a little bit and it just ta- tanked off again and i was like breathe breathe like calm down um, and then, yeah, second time, fortunately, it come up and it was, um, yeah, and it was there, just scooped it in. And, yeah, man, it was... Uh, what, the hook hole must have looked ridiculous in its mouth, man. Oh, it, ridiculous, yeah. It was like a, yeah, hard to even explain. Like, it could easily, easily a big orange, like, yeah. enormous, enormous gob on it. It was mental. And there was my little 20 miller with a little 15 mil pop-up on the top, little snowman just, like, waving around like it was... Yeah, oh unbelievable. My God, mate. Yeah, man. I don't know what I'd do with that. What did you do? Shout? Scream? I, I did shout, and I'm not one for, like, victory screams or shouts or anything like that, but that, I just looked back to him and went, it's the fucking scar. Like, I was screaming, and then I turned around, and as I'd shouted it, I looked around, and Luke had come back from where he was, and he was just stood on his lawn, and he went, oh, it's the big one, is it? Right, I'll be round in a minute. And I was like, oh, shit, now the big boss man's oh, here. Oh, that's well. horrendous, isn't I it? I was like, oh, big boss man's here. He's not happy. I've just caught his big one. And, um, nah, he was good, though. He was sound. He was he was pleased to see it. Um, but his extra pressure when you've got, like... <sighs> that was his livelihood. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. was... And I get that. It's like, that's why people paid the money to go there, because it had that fish. So it was like, right, be careful, like, do everything by the book. But to be fair, he's good as gold. He'd come round, like, helped out with all the pictures and the weigh-in and checking his mouth and stuff. And it was all in good nick. It was sweet. Um, he was pleased to see that it had spawned. It was like, because mm. he was thinking, oh, you know. We so were, it had spawned when you had it? It had spawned, yeah. Well, we think so because... I had it at 92.4. <laughs> I had it at 92.4, but we were at the, he was thinking that if it hadn't, it could have been over 100 so, pounds. Yeah. yeah, so it was like, for me, uh, the size was irrelevant. It was just enormous. How'd you pick that up, mate? I didn't. I just sort of did a little weird sort of uh, cradle with it. There was no picking it up, pushing it out, like making it look big for the camera. Pushing just, it out. It's 90 <laughs> pounds. None of that, mate. It was just to like put my arms under it and say, take the photos fast, please. What it a was, fish. Yeah, man, it was good. It was, um, it was a buzz. And it definitely one of them that sticks. I can picture it all like real, like vivid. Do you know what I mean? I can see it all, remember it all. It's, uh, yeah, that will stick with me forever. That one for sure. I some buzz, mate. Yeah, Ninety man. pounds. Yeah, unbelievable. That's mental. Yeah, I don't quite know where I go next from that. You don't. Do I you? don't. That's I it. don't think there's much PB beating to be done anymore. You go bass fishing or something, mate. Yeah, uh, mullet fishing. M- yeah, yeah. That's got the same highs. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. You go in a boat, don't you? Mullet. Surely you must do some point of mullet fishing. We've gone off topic. Yeah. yeah. But your big fish sort of. Well, I mean, that's ridiculous. That's not even a big fish. That's just unbelievable. But in terms of your your trips and your sort of boat fishing and big fish, another place that I know you visited and, 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 and fished is the infamous Rainbow. Yeah. And that is, well, it's the same ilk. It's big fish fishing. It's boat fishing. There, fishing-wise, was this after your Gravier's trip? Yeah, that was... Um, that came not long after Gravia's actually, to be honest. So I, I'd posted the pictures on <laughs> Facebook, put them up and a load of people had commented, oh, congratulations, brilliant, fantastic. And then, uh, Arjun that used to run a lot of the trips or he does run a lot of the trips at Rainbow. Mm. Um, he commented, um, and he basically said, oh, congratulations, well done. And my, it was actually my old man um, that picked up on it. I knew Arj from when I'd worked at Nash. He, okay. he was working at, uh, I think it was Spiegel magazine, I think was the one. It was like a European magazine. So he was doing that and I knew him through that. So or I I don't know him, know him as such, but he was that was uh, sort of uh, my dealings with him. And uh, Dad, Dad spotted that uh, he'd commented on the picture and he was like, get in touch with him. He, mm. he, he said, how do you know him? And I explained and he was like, message him and just see what the crack is. So I sort of messaged him and said, mate, yeah, thanks for the message. I've, uh, 
I've got the big fish bars. Like I've, I've, I've really fancy a go at rainbow. Like, can you, you know, have you got any ins and stuff like that? Um, and he basically come back and said, I, I do have a lot of trips. Um, sometimes I get cancellations. Can you go at short notice? Mm. Obviously at the time, like I explained a lot of time off from NAS and then, it was like, so yeah, I pretty much can go at short notice. My old man, he works for himself as well. So very fortunate that he could go last minute. And I think it was only, well, it was July that I caught it. So it was only must have been five, six weeks later. Arge messaged and was just like, I've got a cancellation. Do you want to go peg 12 in like a week's time? Yes, please. Sign me up. Where do we go? Like, sweet. So yeah, that was um, that was the first time we managed to go. Uh, went with my dad which that was that was special in itself do you know what I mean I'd always wanted to fish rainbow um f- once I'd heard of it but my old man had heard of it a lot 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 longer before me and for him and for me as well it's like he sees it as the Wembley of fishing yeah. do you know what I mean it's the the pinnacle do you know what I mean for what we wanted to do so um that was good in a respect that a yeah we got to go we got to fish it but I was um, almost buzzing as much that I'd got to between me and my dad I'd managed to get a trip because of this contact so I could get dad to go to Rainbow and tick that one off the list you know so that was good in that respect um, and yeah we had a good trip that was like an unfancied swim for the time of year peg 12 um, I don't think it had been fishing that well and um, yeah we smashed it up it was good smash yeah. it up yeah well I say smash it up by my standards, I was like, yeah, this is good. Like, we caught plenty. I did do a lot of pest controlling. I think I had, like, 30 or 40 fish in the two weeks. But, which, which, well, saying that, by rainbow standards, you can have a lot more than that in a couple of yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah. But for an unfancied peg where people had said, well, you might struggle, I was like, I'll take this all day long. Mm. 30s, 40 pounders, yeah, buzzing. This is great. Um, I managed to have, yeah, I had the bulk of the fish fishing right-hand side of the swim. I had them to 59, I think, just yeah, short of 60. So I was like, yeah, this Pest is... control, that Well, is. I say that, that. That 50 was my only proper decent one of the week. I'd had a fair few, like, 30s and 40s, but there's people out there that they're, like, flopping 40s back mm. in the net. Do you know what I mean? They just unhook them and then put the rod back out and they're not even getting them out. So I've seen Moz's stuff, mate, recently on there. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Um, what, like a 50 every day for two weeks, he had. It's... <sighs> Yeah, insane. Where so, did you fish after that, mate? Well, it's I don't know where you go after that. There's no, I don't think there's anywhere like it in the world. Mm. That it's like the only way I can describe it is if they're on you, it's like a runs water with absolute hippos. Did you have the whole technical fishing round snag style fishing like ah oh, no nah, straight in at the deep end no idea so like okay. this, so going back to that first trip as i said i caught the bulk of the fish my old man fished the left hand side of the swim which was a lot more like mine was straightforward fished over a couple of bars there was a big shelf at the back i caught them all off that it was pretty easy fishing like yeah i had to go out in the boat to get them but it was fine dad's side of the swim he had some more savage bars with loads of branches on and like tree stumps and whatever else. So for, it was his side of the swim where really he had to get his head round like a big bottle flow and mm. double lead in and all of this and whatever else. So that was, he fished the more challenging side of the swim. And to be honest, we, we got the hang of it in the end, but I do remember one of the days he'd got, he'd gone out and he was like, the wind was blowing him about in the boat. He's trying to swing these big two, eight ounce leads around to like double lead and whatever. Else. And he come back and I was like, you not put that rod out. No, no, I haven't. I was like, well, what's up? I'm not doing it. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it. Yeah, it basically, and I get it as well. Yeah. It was like, it's difficult, man, when you've never done it before. So he was just like, no, I'm going to do what I know best. And it was like, right, I'm not going over all the big savage bars. I'm just going to fish short of the bars. Mm. And sure enough, yeah, he clubbed them. He had a... Well, Cast it, him. Uh, no, he did go Very out in the boat, him. load them down, found these tiny little sandy spots in amongst like shit and tree stumps and whatever else. Little tiny sandy spots. And he had, I think he only had five or six for the week, but he had like a mid-60, a 73-pound common uh, and a few other decent backup fish as well. So, on, yeah, dad. man, go on, go on, dad. Yeah, he did all right. So, um, yeah, that was our first trip that was yeah that was just like 
I'd have been happy if I never went back mm. but because it was like, we've done it. We've been to Rainbow. I got to experience it with my dad. Like, what more could I ask for? And um, dad had gone round to the clubhouse. He'd gone for a shower. I think it was on like the Friday. I think our changeovers on Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. So I think he'd gone round on the Friday and he just so happened to catch Pascal just on his own at the clubhouse and um he went in and just said hey pascal like you know we've come on an invitation from arge da, 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 da. Uh, is there any chance of getting a rebooking for me and my son and uh, pascal said oh yeah 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 come with me no problem so um we managed to get another booking for a couple of years time so yeah that was sort of how we managed to get our foot in the door if you like so mm. yeah we managed to go back had another real good trip in 789 that was like I dare say dad would say that's his pinnacle of his carp angling career. He had like five or six 50 pound commons, a mid 60. I had a mid 60. Um, yeah, we had a good week, like 40, 50 fish each, I think in two oh, weeks. That's a dream, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was good. Like we had plenty, um, yeah, numerous 40s, 50s, the odd 60 each and stuff like that. So that was a mega one. Um yeah, that was really good. Enjoyed that. And then uh, after that, we managed to do the same thing again. So end of the week, can we get a rebooking? Yeah, sweet. You can come back in a couple of years' time. Great. We're thinking, excellent. We're getting a rebooking here. This is, we're on. Um, and then Colin Richards, who, yeah. um, infamous rainbow angler, yeah. um, catches more than his fair share out there. He, I used to deal with him when I was working at Nash. He was one of the consultants. So, um he messaged me and said, oh, I've got a trip on the island. Do you want to come out there? Yes. Yes, I do, Colin. <laughs> that that would be lovely if I could join you for a week on the island. So, uh, yeah, that was another eye-opener. That one was, that's where I kind of really then had to learn about, uh, like you were saying, the snag fishing, bottle floats, using uh, stainless pegs and hooks to go round corners and whatever else so yeah another good week on the island with Ke uh, with colin um had yeah commons up to sort of upper 50s i think out there as well that was but it was it's just the whole it's the whole working it out it's mm. the puzzle it's the it's not just flop it in reel them in yeah it's like right they're all down there how am i going to get a bait to them mm. which is easy drop it in the boat but how am i going to get them out with, and and that's what I enjoy the the working out the puzzle of right okay I need a hook over there and I need this here to work out your line angles and basically pull them out of snags and yeah it's it's a completely different way of fishing but I enjoyed it like I loved it it like was carp fishing on steroids yeah 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 essentially it's I've never done anything like it anywhere else no. it's the only place where it's like you've had to employ them tactics and yeah work it out as you go along really so yeah that was good um that was good yeah that was good you know glossing over that um no I enjoyed my time on there with colin that was really good um and then unfortunately our next trip we, yeah. which should have been a year ago something like that yeah it must have been last year obviously covid um no trip so it was like oh and then obviously we weren't the only ones in that boat. So there's a lot of people, can we rebook? Da, 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 and we just basically never managed to get a rebook in. So as it stands, I'm rainbowless. So if anyone can get me a trip on rainbow, hit me up. Um, He's been, don't get him one, get me one. Um, <laughs> um, but is it is it as everybody says it is, which is when you go to rainbow and fish it, you pretty much your level of sort of, addiction expectation and carp fishing goes to here and unless you're fishing rainbow everything feels sort of average yes yeah it definitely gets under your skin mm. there's something about like i said it is like when you're on them there's a lot of fish there is a lot of fish so if they come in you could see 50 shows in and like in a 30 minute like period in a morning and they're not small ones no. <laughs> they're not small ones there's just donkeys no. everywhere so it's like wow this is and the, on top of that i mean yes the fishing's amazing the style of fishing i enjoy yeah. but the setting yeah it's like you're in jurassic park yeah. like you're in the wilderness it's quiet you are in the arse end of nowhere it is beautiful it's quiet until you rogers rogers 
buckles. Man. Yeah, busts okay. off. And it's naught to a thousand, like like someone's just thrown a breeze block through your window in your living room. Just you can be chilling and then it's just hell for leather, just mental. Mental. It honestly, mate, yeah, it's definitely a bucket list, mate. Um, I'm envious, but you'll get another trip out there, definitely. I'm sure, mate. yeah. I'll let you take the old man as well, because yeah, yeah, that's yeah. lovely, isn't it? You two out there. It, mate, it's yeah, I couldn't have asked for anything more to have been able to have gone there and experienced it all with him. And I mean, the first fish that we caught when we went to Peg Twelve, it was like I caught a twenty pounder and we were both stood in the water up to our knees, like whooping and cheering and high fiving, because it was like the first one from Rainbow. <laughs> yeah, you know it's a what rainbow I mean? fish, isn't it? Yeah, it was like it didn't matter how big it was, it was a rainbow fish and we were buzzing. It was Go like on the and it was good. I enjoyed that. It was really good. From the high octane adrenaline fueled fishing of Rainbow to some equally high octane adrenaline fueled, that is you coming back to Nash, mate. <laughs> Jesus. Welcome to the party. Back in the game. How, I should say why, is probably not the right way to put it. Um, how have you managed to find yourself back here, really? Talk me through that process. I've got no idea, mate. No. Um, <laughs> no. I was lost in Essex <laughs> and I found her. Yeah, basically, uh, sat nav was on autopilot too. <laughs> um, no, it was... Uh, obviously in all the years that I left and went to NAS and sort of did what we did with the show, um, I still kept in touch with all the Nash boys. They were, it was never like, oh, that's where I used to work. They're all my friends. I mm. still see them regularly. We go out, we go to festivals, we do. So I was still part of the Nash team, if you like, um, in a different capacity, um, Basically, the annoying one that would turn up every few months was what uh, <laughs> that, yeah, oh, he's back again and he's causing carnage. Oh, so, yeah, that was basically it. So, I kept in touch with them all. Uh, and then obviously, COVID came around and phew, the future of the shows looked mm. like uncertain. You know, I didn't know, as I'm sure many people, I didn't know whether there would be any events ever again. I didn't know whether we would party ever again. I didn't know whether there'd be fishing shows. I didn't know whether we could, like, the same as everybody else. So it was like, for 18 months or so, I was like, what am I going to do? My job, like, my show, or our show that we've just built has just been swept away, and what am I going to do? So, um... I did a bit of work with my old man. I sort of did a little bit of labouring and whatever else just to keep ticking along and not go insane, sat at home twiddling my thumbs. Yeah. Um, and then it just come about, um, yeah, a few weeks, about like a month or two ago, uh, Alan had called me and said, look, we've got an opportunity. Do you uh, Are you interested? I said, well what is it firstly if it's back to the warehouse thanks but no thanks <laughs> <laughs> thanks for no thanks um but yeah so he said look you know um can i say this now is mike leave i can say mike's you leaving can, yeah you can say I this think, yeah. it's all good uh, mikey's podcast would have been out yeah okay that's good so mike's leaving um we need someone to come in and oversee product development basically be a coordinator someone that pulls all the moving parts together mm. um and running a show kind of one of my attributes is being organized and sort of yeah it fit i just sort of felt i fitted the role obviously kev and alan also thought the same they sort of thought yeah he can come in and do what we need him to do here yeah um and it was pretty much as simple as that. Like I say, I didn't know what was happening with the shows. That's now, to be honest, now that I've started, it's actually looking a lot more positive for the shows. Like the venue's back open, we can do events again, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I've left the show in good hands, um, sort of handed over. I've still got my involvement with it um, mm. as a director, et cetera. So I've not completely dumped it. I'm still going to oversee and help and be there along the way for for the show itself. Um but yeah, the the bulk of the work will be done by someone else, and I found myself here taking over from uh, Mikey. So yeah, I am quite looking forward to it. I think I can add something to the party, and um, yeah, hopefully it all pans out all right. Nervous? A little bit. Yes, yeah, big shoes to fill. Do you know what I mean? When I was here last time, it was Kev, Al, me, a few other people, Gary, and like mm. a f handful of others. And now I've come back and it's a monster. Do you know yeah. what I mean? There's teams out in Europe and there's like a full team here. And a, it's just enormous. And the company has grown massively since yeah. I was here. And that is going to be partly down to the success of the products that they've released and launched and done throughout the years that I've been away. So, yeah, to come in, I think, 
yeah, big shoes to fill kind of thing. I hope I do it well. Um, but I think we'll be all right. I get on well with Kev, um, get on well with Alan. So it's like, well, I'm working with two mates and yeah, what can, what can possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> nah, you'll do well, mate. You've got that sort of dynamic personality that you need to organize and keep all those balls in the air when it comes to product. But at the, the baseline, if you like of it is product where the responsibility is, is pretty much everything, especially when it comes to Nash, cause like innovation but also products that are they're the strength of the company there's not really any media and marketing that can polish a poor product do you know what i mean it's got to do whatever it is designed to do whatever that aspect may be but mate i've i've got the utmost confidence in it i was excited knowing that you'd got it just because i know the character that you are mate i think uh, the professional side i just sort of left but i thought in terms of banter general upbeat nature and energy you are the one boy, ain't you? Yeah, well, I do my best, you know. You know. <laughs> Absolute boy. Um, for you, what do you what are your immediate thoughts with regards to getting started? Because obviously getting started in a new job is I mean, it's you've been here, but it's different, like you said, but it's also like it's a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a bit Getting started, I mean, this first couple of weeks has just been mental, mm. mental, especially the time that I've come in now. So a lot of projects are coming to the end of their cycle, if you like. So all the gear is, it's almost, it's done now. The, the last range of stuff is done. Mike's seeing it through right to the very end. Mm. But I've kind of come in at a point now where all the final samples are ready. It's all coming together. It's ready to go to the trade show for the shops to see, etc. So rather than me coming in and it's like, right, we've got a new project. We want you to find or source or do with it. Or you X, Y, Z. It's kind of, I've come in right at the end of a whirlwind. Yeah. So that's a bit like whoa overwhelming like bit mental um but i think i'm slowly getting my head around it like picking up from mike he's been really good he's showing me each step that he's doing at this final stage and then once mike goes um i'm pretty much going to be alongside like alan and kev picking up from the beginning of a number of new projects for following years so that's nice isn't it timing wise it's not like you're if you're in the middle that'd be a nightmare yes to get it out in time yeah but if you're seeing out and mike as you say is staying on to see out those you pick up quite fresh don't you yeah that's it i think having a fresh start on it it'll be like yeah, I think I'll just, well, it's just the bits that I'll, I'll know then. I'll know where I'm at. What's, yeah, what stage are we at with this? Well, I'll know. Whereas at the minute, yeah, I haven't got a clue what stage we're at, mate. Yeah. It's like Wilson's done it. It's already confirmed. It's already on the way here. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, I'm sure once I get into it and um, yeah, start on stuff for myself and start working with Alan and Kev, I'll pick it up. A uh, few ideas in the pipeline, mate? Yeah, we've got a few. Good. What, like... ZT clothing with inbuilt decks. I was thinking decks for the bank and portable for stalking, decks. When you do that, it's quiet stalking on intimate estate lakes. You need a couple of decks. Just Mate, the they, they're not scared of music. <laughs> they're not. They're not. They love it. I've tested it thoroughly. I have. I have. <laughs> they are not scared. I look forward to it, mate. It's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you and uh, getting on the bank with you, mate. They're, yeah, mate. I mean, your fishing time is going to be limited. Yes. But, especially initially, but we will definitely get out there. Yeah, point. for sure. Before you go, I've thoroughly enjoyed your podcast. I've learned a lot about you, but I've got some bespoke, tailored Nash Quickfire questions to throw at you um, to learn a little bit more about you, I think. These will be quite interesting. Okay. Obviously, I've got to pick up my sheet of paper. I've typed these out for you, mate. What's he gone for? It? Oh no, 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 no! What are you doing here, buddy? What's he? Was he picked up off the floor there? Read this. It's got to be genuine. No notes taken on these. Did I send you all of these? Yeah, that's a school. But get that mic up there. You're going to have to edit all this bit out. Go oh, back to no. yeah. No, now, we don't edit anything out. But now everyone will know that you sent me the quick fire questions. No, I'll edit that bit out. Well, there we go then. Yeah, that's I what I meant. You know? you, I haven't sent you these before though. Oh no. So this is off the cuff, mate. <laughs> oh, for fuck. You ready? Yeah, go on. <laughs> right. Three words to describe yourself. Loud, energetic, annoying. Annoying? <laughs> yeah, If definitely for a lot of people, I could be considered highly annoying. Tom Foreman would be a prime example. <laughs> Tommy boy. All right, 24 hours partying or 24 hours fishing? Partying. Really, without a doubt. Easy, yeah. I can go fishing whenever, but partying's the one. Three famous 
people you'd take fishing? They can be dead or alive. Gaza. Gaza and Reedy. Oh, my God. Imagine it. It'd be good, would it I not? Don't, I um, don't want to imagine God, it. Who else? All I see is blue flashing lights when I imagine that. Mate. It, quite probable, yeah. Um, oh, famous people. Jimmy Carr, he'd be funny. Jimmy Carr, that yeah. is a mix. You, Gaza, and Jimmy Carr. Yeah, oh, I've got one more as well. Yeah, you've got three. Um, famous people. Oh, I don't know, I'm stuck on the third one. Come on, mate. Shall I just pick uh, Lionel Richie? Lionel Richie? Why not? It's got some music in there's all sorts going on. You know what I mean? Lionel mix, just there. like playing nice tunes in the background. It's very good. Relaxed, Lionel. It'd be right. Fair play. I like that. Um, <laughs> well, this would be an interesting one. Would you be an MC professionally or a pro angler? Oh, I'd go pro angler. Would you? Yeah. That if you if you if you'd ask DJ or <clears throat> sorry pro angler DJ then DJ or pro angler DJ all day long. I think you'd be a good MC, mate. <sighs> Maybe. Okay. Fair play. Um, what's your inspiration, or who is your inspiration? Um, tough one. I don't think as though I've got much. Yeah, I don't think there's many people that inspire me. Probably like, is it really self-centered to say myself? No, no. Yeah, probably myself. Then I like. I don't. I'm not looking to achieve, or I don't look at someone and think, oh, I want that. I just think, get up and do the best that you can each day. That's kind of yeah. Just do the best that you can do. So I guess that's my inspiration, I think, really. Love that, Reedy. Um, One thing you'd remove from carp fishing? Anglers? (laughs) No, no, that's a lie. Um, Online negativity. I hate trolls and moaning and, oh, shut up, just get on with it. Yeah? Yeah. Nice. Um, What do you think of, or the first thing that pops into your mind when I say Nash? Lovely times. (laughs) Nice. <laughs> one carp you wish you'd caught? Uh, Black Mirror. Oh, it's the one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, who's the best on the decks? Ollie Davies or Alan Blair? Oh, you can't ask I'll me that. I'll put you in there, boy. Okay, I'm going to say Ollie, but there's a reason. Oh! <sighs> there's a reason, and it's because Alan always turns my headphones off when I'm trying to listen. Oh, mate, you've got out of that, I think. You've actually said that somebody's better than your boss, so you were product development for about two weeks. (laughs) And that (laughs) was the end. Uh, One event which you wish you could attend right this very second. Uh, Glastonbury. Glastonbury? Yeah. You've been before? Yeah, once. Best thing I've ever done. Best thing in your life you've ever done? Yeah. Wow. It was sick. It was the best. That is it endearing um yeah memory if it's the best thing you've ever done in your life better than the scar yeah up there oh you beauty uh last question go on night in with the missus night out on the bank what are you choosing uh the missus i mean that did i didn't even have to think about that i know yeah yeah definitely the missus instinct reaction like that boom yeah. really you're a legend mate thank you so much for doing it i no doubt we'll get you in a few months time back on the podcast with a little update as to how you're getting on the people will see what you uh, bring to the nash party over the course of time thank you guys for watching and listening please subscribe and leave us a review reedy all the best mate i'll see you very soon so mate thank you mate thanks for having me on